Thank you all for being back for our 115 start that even I couldn't make. Um, apologize. Eh, you get 15, you lose 15. That's how it goes. Next up, right over here. Staff, how are we doing? Are we okay? Are we online? Okay, thank you. Next up, workforce and affordable housing issues. Harvard Gov look, Harvard Growth Lab. Ah, we are. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Uh, my name is Eric Brotzer. I'm a senior research fellow at the Harvard Growth Lab. Uh, I want to thank you all a bunch for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I'm actually from a former coal mining town of 3,000 people, and it's not often that I get to work in places like Wyoming, but it is a real pleasure to be able to do so. Uh, I have been working on the Pathways to Prosperity project with my team in coordination with the Wyoming Business Council and uh, other state agencies as well. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, housing regulations. And uh, I want to give you a bit of a sense of how we've gotten to that issue through the project so that you can get a sense of where I'm hoping we can collaborate to make things happen that will provide boosts for the economy of Wyoming as well as in housing specifically. And uh, that is that when we go through these projects, including in the state of Wyoming, uh, we go through these you know, diagnostic methods to home in on what are the biggest constraints in the economy that are preventing growth and economic diversification. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, you know, recognition in the state that uh, housing is in a uh, troublesome state at the moment, but uh, we've assembled quantitative evidence that not only is housing uh, something that is unaffordable, it's actually holding back the Wyoming economy. And we think that this is an urgent matter. We think that this is one of the top matters that most affects the Wyoming economy. So I really hope that we'll be able to partner with you going forward to look at some of these regulatory issues that pertain to housing, because we do think that they're quite important. Um, now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to get us to a spot where we're going to be able to have a sense of some of the housing deregulations that we're thinking about at the Harvard Growth Lab and that we're hoping to go forward and uh, discuss and work together with local leaders and state leaders, including yourselves, in order to uh, target some of the largest communities in Wyoming to expand the housing supply. So I, I want to get us to that point and to also understand not just what are those solutions that we're recommending, but really why are those important? What are the problems behind housing in Wyoming? And what kind of things could you expect for the state of Wyoming if you fix those problems? So to begin with, uh, you know, I want to look at what is the housing problem in Wyoming. Then I want to look at what is causing the housing problem in Wyoming. And that's very important. We feel that when you come up with solutions for these things, they have to be targeted really at the core problems in order to have an effect. We're going to look at what would the benefits to the state of Wyoming be if you address these housing challenges. And then finally, we're going to look at the specific regulatory recommendations that we're making, uh, you know, deregulation, essentially, that we're recommending with regard to housing. So to begin with, the problem, uh, what is the problem with housing in Wyoming? And a lot of people, you know, they recognize that there is some kind of problem that housing is unaffordable, that it makes it difficult for businesses to hire sometimes because you can't find somewhere to house your workforce. Uh, but we felt it was important to really nail this down quantitatively. Like, what is the exact problem? Not just having a sense that, okay, it's unaffordable. And we assembled quantitative evidence to show that the supply of housing in Wyoming is not very responsive to prices. It's insufficiently responsive to demand, so you're not getting enough supply to meet the demand that exists for housing. And uh, it, you know, in, in the slides, which I, I think you have, the details of that are in the appendix. I, I won't get into the hairy technicals because it, it might be a bit uh, time consuming, but the headline conclusions are that prices have remained elevated persistently in Wyoming uh, above what economic fundamentals would suggest. So you've got a signal of high demand for housing in Wyoming. 
but at the same time, you can analyze the supply elasticities of housing in Wyoming. You know, whether uh, there is new housing construction in response to those price signals. And what we find is that the vast majority of counties in Wyoming have less responsive housing uh, elasticity than the average US county. And that is doubly important because the US as a whole is widely considered to be a country that uh, is, is not very elastic with regard to the housing supply. So you've got a country that doesn't build much housing compared to other developed countries. And then within that, Wyoming fares worse than other counties around the US at building out that supply in order to meet that demand. And so what you get is that instead of having supply meeting that demand and a functional market that is efficient and affordable, you get a bidding war and you get prices going higher and higher and higher. And it is very important to emphasize that this is not just a pandemic hangover. This is not just you know some kind of result of all the relocation choices that people have made in the last couple of years. Uh, the evidence that we have assembled shows that this has been a durable problem going back at least 15 years. And if we had more data, it might show it, it goes back even further. So you know when we see these kinds of signals that something is in demand, in high demand, but supply is not rising to meet that, that causes alarm bells to go off in our heads because that, that means that there is something that people really want and there is not the supply to meet that. And that indicates some kind of blockage that is happening in the economy. And as, as we're gonna see later on, that has serious consequences for Wyoming's economic growth and diversification. So if we have established that the problem in Wyoming housing is that supply is not sufficiently responsive to demand, the next step is to ask, well, why is that? What is going wrong that is gumming up the system that is preventing the free market from creating that housing supply to meet that demand? Uh, and we assessed a, a variety of different avenues that could lead to that in order to identify where really are the blockages. Now, there's some things that get commonly talked about in Wyoming that we assessed as uh, being more kind of global problems as opposed to Wyoming specific problems. Uh, for example, the cost of materials and the uh, current you know, cost of labor being elevated due to global macroeconomic conditions. It, it certainly is true that, for example, materials costs have shot up in recent years, but uh, the materials costs that we can quantify are pretty well in line with US averages as a whole. So we see those kinds of problems as global problems due to recent macroeconomic conditions where it's the White House that really needs to act on that and coordinate global action to ease those global macroeconomic conditions. Where we feel there is uh, you know, more serious areas of genuine constraint uh, are in regulations, which is mo most relevant to your committee, and then also in arterial infrastructure, which I won't spend a lot of time on today, but I do want to just note so that you guys have a complete picture of uh, what is going on in the housing situation in Wyoming. So let's, um, let's start by looking at the regulatory issues. Now, uh, Wyoming, of course, is known as a fairly low regulation state. I, th I think there was a quote earlier today that, you know, there's only 4 million words of regulation in Wyoming versus, you know, 3 million in Idaho, the best in the country. Uh, but when it comes to housing in particular, there is good evidence that Wyoming is, in fact, highly overregulated. So one example of that is that uh, we, we, you know, we cite this uh, study from the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank in Washington, D.C., where they evaluated all different states' uh, overregulation in land use and in zoning. And the way they did that, and we thought this was uh, you know, very useful to do, is they looked at lawsuits per capita that occur with regard to land use and with, with regard to zoning in all different states. And that's a very useful signal because if somebody files for a lawsuit about something, it, you know, they better have a damn good reason why. They better uh, be able, you, you know, there, there is going to, there is something painful in the economy and they are, uh, you know, pursuing that lawsuit in order to try to overcome that. Um, and it turns out that Wyoming is in the top third of US states in terms of overregulation of land use and zoning regulations. Now, in order to break down where that comes from, uh, we think of two different categories of, uh, of overregulation and regulation generally when it comes to housing in Wyoming. One of those categories is with regard to housing density, regulations that pertain to housing density. And then another category is with regard to the housing approval process itself. 
So let's let's touch on each of those. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you know in this, in the slides I provided an example of a series of graphs that pertain to minimum lot sizes. That's uh, one of the issues that pertains to housing density. Other things include maximum building height. Uh, you know, the allowed uh, materials that you're allowed to use in a building, the number of dwellings that can occur within a certain unit of area, uh, and zoning laws that uh, say, you know, you can only build certain types of structures within these types of zones. Uh, so th those are some of the things that can pertain to regulations in, uh, in housing density. Um, now, in the graphs that I've shown, just to illustrate a point of an example of how this works in practice, you'll notice that I've given you uh, these histograms of minimal lot sizes in uh, different counties in Wyoming. And uh, the way you can read these is that uh, if there is a vertical black line, it means that there is a regulatory barrier there. And that's what we've highlighted. Now, in a free market, which is on the left-hand graph in the first of the slides we provided to you, you'll see that the distribution of minimum lot sizes where, you know, the, the x-axis is what is the lot size and the y-axis is how many parcels of land in that community are at that lot size. So the left-hand graph is where there are no regulations in place. And it's a it's a pretty smooth distribu distribution you'll notice, and that's how you should that's how it should happen in a free market. People have a variety of uh, you know levels of demand for different say sizes of land, and that gets freely supplied in order to match that demand. But what you'll notice in some of the other graphs that we've shown is that there is sometimes a vertical black line where on the one side of the graph there will be a much higher count of the number of lots that are right jutting up against that uh, minimum regulata regulated lot size. And what that means is that the true organic market demand that consumers and individuals are actually demanding, you know, they're not allowed to pursue that. So you have all these people that are hitting up against these minimum regulations, and they would probably like to have uh, smaller minimum lot sizes, for example, but they cannot because uh, of these regulations in place. And that is something that leads to market inefficiencies. It escalates the uh, price of housing, makes it more un unaffordable, uh, less efficient. So that, that, that's an example. Uh, but, you know, I, I noted some of these other uh, issues that pertain to uh, housing density as well. The, the flip side is uh, to look at the housing approval process. Um, because, you know, you have all these restrictions on what can be built where, but oftentimes when you're trying to propose a development, a project, it has to go through, you know, various approval processes. And what we have found, uh, you know, in our estimation is that a lot of these housing approval processes are relatively vetocratic as opposed to democratic. And by that, I mean that, you know, a community typically already elects a town council in order to make these kinds of uh, approvals all together as a community. But uh, what can happen, for example, with protest petitions is that if you have, say, a rezoning application for a specific lot, then within that broader community, uh, people who are within a few hundred feet of that particular rezoning application, they get a letter asking if they approve or disapprove. And if 20% of those people say no, then it requires a super majority from town council to pass as opposed to a simple majority. And uh, it's, it's obvious why that can create obstruction. You know, if just a handful of people within that tiny part of community, uh, you know, only 20% within a few hundred feet uh, don't like the projects, then it doesn't, it doesn't go ahead. Uh, at the same time, the uh, structure of public hearings, uh, which, which, you know, is to be fair, is rather typical for the US, but is also the case in, you, in, uh, in Wyoming. Uh, also lends itself to these vetocratic elements that don't necessarily survey the general opinion of the community as a whole. Um, you know, when you have these public hearings, which are typically multiple throughout a housing approval process, uh, you know, it just lends itself, given the incentives to go out of your way to show up to these things, that if you actually go out of your way and you do that, it's probably because you're one of the people who is most opposed to the project. And, uh, you know, not only does that create all these bureaucratic delays and these uncertainties, these risks in, well, maybe the project will go forward, maybe it won't. Uh, but again, it's, it's arguably more vetocratic than democratic. And there are, are alternatives that I'd like to explore to you that are more 
uh, efficient and also more systematic about surveying uh, public opinion. Um, now, in addition to those, I did mention that arterial infrastructure is an issue as well. Uh, you know, there's, there's evidence that uh, a lot of communities in Wyoming have relatively high demand for these things. Lots of, uh, you know, requests for funding for arterial infrastructure tend to be put out. Uh, and on top of that, it tends to be the communities that have developed arterial infrastructure uh, on a wider basis than other communities that tend to have somewhat a more affordable housing on the whole. So we, we think that that is an issue as well. Uh, it might not be something for the purview of your committee, but I just wanted to put it on the table so you're aware of it uh, when you're, say, coordinating with colleagues over this. So if we've established housing supply is unresponsive to demand in Wyoming, and we know that uh, regulations are a serious reason why, and we know that arterial infrastructure is also a serious reason why, we should, we should next ask, well, why is this worth pursuing? What are the reasons that uh, you know, we should do this in order to get some kind of a payoff? We know that uh, political capital and attention and all of your time is uh, very you know, limited and valuable. So why is it important to concentrate on this in particular? Um, of course, the obvious reason why is to make housing more affordable. But I want to highlight a couple of other reasons that we think will be crucial to the future economic development of Wyoming. And I want to uh, emphasize again that uh, when we're thinking about these kinds of solutions, we're thinking about targeting especially the largest communities in Wyoming. You could apply these kinds of reforms so that you get an expansion of housing supply in just, say, the largest cities and not necessarily the rural areas. They may want to be left alone. I'm a rural guy. You know, I, I kind of get that. Um, so if you were to, say, expand the housing supply in these larger communities, what are the things that you would see that would be beneficial for the economy of Wyoming? Uh, to begin with, you would see greater potential for economic diversification in Wyoming's largest communities. And there's a relationship there that's not often acknowledged, but is very, very important in economics, and I think is important to highlight. And it's that agglomeration is a very powerful force. You'll notice that among the slides I sent you, there is uh, just a very basic graph that is showing the size of different communities in the US, Canada, and Mexico versus the number of tradable industries with at least 100 employees. And there's a pretty clear relationship that you know if you want to get to a point where you have a diversified set of industries, you're going to need a certain amount of scale. And like I said, it doesn't have to happen everywhere in Wyoming. Uh, but if you did this in just a couple of your leading communities, there would be much greater potential for economic diversification. A lot of industries that are more sophisticated uh, that require lots of different types of skills in one place tend, in fact, to only happen in larger agglomerations of population. And so that, that we see as really a key benefit to the economy of Wyoming, that if you really even want to play the game of economic diversification, you need some kind of agglomeration in which that can happen. And uh, that, I think, would address a lot of the concerns that were say uh, raised earlier about the boom bust cycle in Wyoming and how that can leave people vulnerable to the downturns. Uh, as was iterated earlier, it's not something where you would want to remove that from Wyoming. You don't want to get rid of your natural resources. Those are, you know, a God given blessing. But if you have something in addition to that, uh, you know, a proper sized agglomeration where uh, people can find uh, alternative types of jobs and you have a diversified economy that helps to protect you against those busts to a very significant degree. So that's, that's the first reason, and I, I do feel it is a very important one. The second reason that I want to highlight is that even if you just had an expansion of housing supply that led to these kinds of agglomeration forces in larger Wyoming communities, rural communities would stand to benefit significantly. There is a lot of evidence that rural communities tend to be more economically prosperous when they're in the vicinity of a somewhat larger agglomeration. And you can think of all the reasons why. You can think that, you know, if you're uh, in this rural area, you can sell agricultural goods to a larger market. You can sell tourism services to the larger market. You can have people commuting back and forth uh, to find jobs they might not have otherwise. And uh, as a result of that, you also get flows of knowledge that go back and forth that can unlock, uh, you know, potentially new industries in rural areas as knowledge spillovers that come from those larger communities. The third reason that I think is worth highlighting uh, with regard to pursuing these housing reforms 
is, uh, you know, thinking about all the young people that leave Wyoming. Uh, you know, it, it's, I've heard it said that 70% of University of uh, Wyoming graduates leave the state. Uh, we ran the numbers on young people generally, and Wyoming is the state that has the highest share of young people living outside the state who are born in the state uh, by a, a, a fairly wide margin. And, uh, you know, there are economic benefits to bringing those people that you've invested all this money educating, uh, having them still in the state and contributing to economic activity. Uh, and in addition to that, I would argue that there's a cultural benefit. You know, uh, if you want to keep Wyoming, Wyoming, then uh, there is an argument that you want to give your young people reasons to stay. And to begin with, housing affordability by itself is a reason to keep young people in the state that helps to, you know, subdue a major cost in their life for them. But at the same time, if you pursue these kinds of reforms uh, and you have urban growth in the largest agglomerations, uh, then that creates all kinds of additional reasons for young people to stay in the state. You can think of the urban amenities that come in with a larger community, things like more restaurants, more coffee shops, better air service. Uh, I know that's something that people talk a lot about in Wyoming. Uh, and at the same time, the economic diversification that accompanies those larger agglomerations gives more diverse job opportunities for young people to stay in the state. So, you know, all being told, we think that this is a, a pretty major issue that would deliver uh, some significant payoffs to the state if it was seriously pursued. Now, with all that in mind, we should think about uh, what are the specific uh, reforms and regulatory reductions that uh, we want to have a conversation about, you know? Uh, what we want to do is we want to take these ideas and we want to uh, bring in folks from local government, from state government, and your committee in order to put our heads together and say, can we get some of this stuff passed so that there is an expansion of the housing supply? And again, I would reiterate that we don't need to do this in all the rural communities that might not like it. We can really just think of working with the larger communities, uh, some of which may be more amenable to these kinds of expansions of housing supply, expansions of the economy and of population. So the first category of reforms comes in removing restrictions on housing density. So that's, remember that laundry list of things that I told you about, you know, all those restrictions on minimum lot sizes and building heights and what kind of material you can and cannot use when you're building a house and the number of dwellings that are allowed in a certain area and even zoning that says you're only allowed to build this particular type of house in this location, no matter what the market demands. Those are all areas where there could be concerted action on deregulation in order to make, uh, you know, housing supply more of something that is free to market forces in order to respond to the real demand that actually exists in a place. Um, the next category of, uh, well, the next item to consider to my mind would be uh, looking at protest petitions. Uh, so those are the, you know, the, the process I described where if there's a rezoning proposed, you, you know, you get a letter and 20% of people say no, it, it requires a super majority. Um, that holds up a lot of, uh, you know, development. It's arguably more vetocratic than democratic, and it could be something that could be considered to be removed or uh, substantially reformed in some of the larger communities in order to make that natural housing supply from the free market more responsive to demand. Um, the, the, uh, the, the next category to look at would be the public hearings, similarly related, where, uh, you know, as it stands, you've got to go through all these different public hearings in the housing approval process. It can be very bureaucratic, very vetocratic, not especially democratic. And uh, an alternative approach we would, uh, you know, want to at least bring heads together to think about would be instead of having all these different public hearings interspersed through each individual housing project, front load them. Do a very systematic survey of public opinion so that you're not just capturing the loudest voices in the room, you're capturing everyone in the community. Do that upfront when you're making your city plans. And then you don't necessarily need to have those public hearings that take up so much, uh, you know, bureaucracy and uh, add so much uncertainty to the uh, housing approval process. Uh, you know, if you, if you do that instead, you can just front load it, have it done all at once, very thoroughly, very systematically, saving uh, a lot of time and effort for everyone involved. 
the final category uh, that we want to look at, and this isn't necessarily something that would be a regulatory reduction, but again, I want to put it on your radar, uh, would be to look at somehow in some form bringing back extraterritorial jurisdiction in some of the largest Wyoming communities. And I want to say right out of the gate, that is probably going to be the most controversial of the uh, ideas to pursue. It, it would be, um, you know, something that I, I know was uh, gotten rid of for a purpose. Uh, I think that if we were to look at that, what we'd need to do is not just bring back extraterritorial jurisdiction as it used to be. We would need to, you know, go to the counties, go to the people who live there, and we need to really understand what caused this to be painful. And are there ways we could bring this back so that it would be less painful or more acceptable to you folks? And the benefit to doing that if it were pursued would be that it would allow uh, some of the larger cities in Wyoming to expand more organically. Uh, if, if you don't have extraterritorial jurisdiction, then, well, I mean, for background, you know, when it, it used to be around, cities could apply things like zoning and water infrastructure a couple of miles beyond their borders, and it made the outward expansion of cities, uh, you, you know, much easier. It facilitated a quite quick expansion of cities as needed, uh, you know, as needed organically. Um, but since that's been uh, removed, that's a much more arduous process. So that, that would probably be uh, something that I, I readily admit would be difficult to pursue, but I, it would be something where I would at least want to have that conversation. So with all that in mind, uh, you know, thinking about next steps, uh, I, I, you know, I would love to see one of the regulatory sub reform subcommittees, the regulatory reduction subcommittees that you guys are pursuing. I think it would be very valuable for the state of Wyoming to have a subcommittee on this issue. We'd want to work with you guys. We'd want to work with, uh, you, you know, the, the local government, the governor's office, you guys, uh, to try and, and bring your heads together and say, you know, can we get some of these reforms put through in order to make uh, the housing markets in some of these key communities in Wyoming more determined by free market principles of supply and demand. So with that, uh, I, I wanna thank you and I'll open the floor up to any comments or questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Broadsir, thank you. Um, do those of you that thought we were gonna be back for nap time, I give you Eric. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was, uh, that was the fire hose plus. Um, questions, Senator Cole. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question about extraterritorial jurisdiction and the problems it caused in the past. Why wouldn't annexation be a, a, a tool they already have for the cities to annex within the county? Why would you, I guess, be in favor of bringing back extraterritorial jurisdiction as opposed to just annexation? Certainly, certainly. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Senator. Um, the, the key reason, as I understand it, from talking to planners in uh, some of these larger communities in Wyoming is that when extraterritorial jurisdiction was around, it made the annexation process a lot smoother because you could have the existing uh, zoning already applied in uh, some of the areas outside your formal city boundaries, as well as having the kind of infrastructure there uh, that matches up with your city directly. So, you know, if, if there's some kind of incongruence, then, you know, when you perform that annexation, it can become much more difficult because there's a bunch of things that have to be revised from the infrastructure to the zoning, et cetera, et cetera, in order to have it line up uh, with the city. So I, I just understand that uh, it would make the process more efficient. Question. Harvard Growth Lab does these kind of studies at other places around the country. You've given us an awful lot to chew on here. And frankly, looking out at the audience as you were talking, a lot of sea change here as far as how people in Wyoming look at their neighborhoods, the rural aspect, the rural nature, whether no matter where you live, even in the largest population county that we live in. There's a barn that I used to live in a you know, block away from here. And the very rural nature, the, the size of buildings and all that is something that is more, you know, is of Wyoming. And what you're talking about is an urbanization and trying to get those economies to scale. And so my question is, when you've been or when the Harvard Growth Lab has gone into other rural areas and brought out some of these concepts, what kind, of, what kind of reception do you receive? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, you know, I 
completely get what you're getting at. Like I said, I'm from a former coal mining town of 3,000 people. I probably wouldn't be very happy if someone came along and said, we want to turn your town into like a, you know, a big city. Uh, so I, I, I completely get that. I think that, uh, you know, if, if I can provide one parallel for somewhere else I've worked that, uh, you know, might, might be useful, uh, at least somewhat comparable. We, we worked in the state of Western Australia, which, uh, you know, very big mining activity happens a lot in very rural regions. Uh, some of the things we discussed were, you know, way up north where you have that mining activity, it, it would be good to get some, some kind of agglomeration around that activity to take advantage of it. But I, I think the deeper question you're getting at is, is this something that really matches with Wyoming's identity? And, uh, you know, it, it's it's something that I I think um, I, I I I get why there is the hesitation around that. I think there are at the same time a lot of economic benefits that would result from having this just in the largest communities. I think what you could have is you could basically leave rural areas alone, and that honestly not a lot would change. Maybe they would become a bit more prosperous because of this uh, interaction. But uh, the bulk of this change it probably would be concentrated in the larger areas. And I, I might add that, you, you know, I, I don't think it would be realistic to expect, even if you enacted all of these deregulations that facilitate the expansion of housing and population, you know, you, you're not going to turn into Denver, you're not going to turn into New York City. I, I just don't see it in the cards. I, I think, uh, you know, you could, you could I, I think uh, I heard it once or twice that, you could, I, I think, double the population of Wyoming and the population density at that point would become equal to that of uh, North Dakota, which I understand you're not always bumping into a lot of people all the time in North Dakota. So I, 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 I think that some kind of moderate urban growth, uh, and I think especially coupled with the point that it could be more attractive for young people, you know, who are leaving Wyoming, those who have, are born and raised Wyoming, living in, in those kinds of agglomerations. So I, I, you know, I guess there's a question of, do you want your kids and your grandkids living in, say, an apartment in Denver or a townhouse in Cheyenne? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, your your uh, discussion about having a larger population center, leaving the rural areas alone. In Wyoming, we uh, are somewhat unique in that we've got a lot of rural areas, but in those states where we have those large population centers, and I'll just use Colorado, for example. Our agricultural people that I discuss things with in Colorado are continually challenged by those urban populations that seem to dictate management practices that really affect agriculture to the point where we've had a lot of folks in agriculture move from Colorado to Wyoming or move somewhere else. And then we won't even go to, Cal to California because those folks out there have a whole level of problems above what we've even considered. So uh, wh where's that balance at? Because at some point, just by the nature of our system, those urban areas are going to start dictating to the rural areas, sometimes to the extent that you drive those rural people out. And, you know, again, Colorado is somewhat of an example where they have done a lot of getting rid of, uh, of some of the rural areas and challenging those others that are still there. What, what's the trade-off there? Yeah, so um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, is it Representative or Senator Hamilton? Uh, actually, I'm for the one. There you go, perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, um, look, I, I, again, I, I get the concern. I grew up surrounded by farms. I had you know, horses everywhere, everything like that. I, I wouldn't really want that uh, taken, taken away if it were my community. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, if you are concerned about that, it might be something to look at maybe in parallel to these efforts. Could you promulgate laws that would protect that kind of agricultural uh, agricultural activity in, in in advance, you know, of any kind of urban growth happening. And uh, again, I would reiterate, I I don't think it would be realistic to expect you're going to get a Denver any <laughs> certainly not not anytime soon uh, within Wyoming. I th I think you know if you could get a city or two up to the 100,000 kind of range. I think that would have that would by itself uh, bring a lot of benefits that would actually stabilize rural life. I, I think one of the, you know, one of the um, threats to rural life in Wyoming is that right now a lot of uh, tax revenue 
comes from the mineral economy, the fossil fuel economy, and whether you know we like it or not, the world at large is out to decarbonize, and there is a threat that some of that revenue eventually goes away. So having uh, you know some urban centers of a a some kind of scale, not not New York, not Denver, but some kind of scale, it provides some kind of alternative economic activity that in the future can stabilize the economy of Wyoming and uh, perhaps even make that rural activity more viable well into the future, regardless of what happens with regard to uh, the carbon economy. Senator, I'd... Thank you for... Oh, Chief, <laughs> before I do. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Davis. <laughs> you can saw me. Have you... Has water been addressed in this expansion that you're considering? There's a quite a shortage in, you know, right now the, the city of Cheyenne is on a trans basin diversion from another part of the state. So, you know, all across the front range down there, you're seeing on the Colorado side, water rights being sold to the front range. So you're dry, drying up agriculture for municipal needs and then Another part of my question to you is, what about the urban decay within the community? Once you're building to the outside, the center seems to go bad, right? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Davis. So you have two questions, one about water and one about urban decay. Uh, on the first, regarding the water issue, I, I agree, that's a really important issue to consider. Uh, the arterial infrastructure and the deficiency thereof, especially with regard to water and sewage, uh, is something that I, I think needs to be addressed to, uh, you know, facilitate this kind of, uh, you know, a housing supply. Um, from what I understand, uh, you know, there are some deficiencies of water around Cheyenne. Uh, there are other parts of the state that maybe have a little more leeway. Uh, I would certainly encourage, alongside any efforts on deregulation, looking seriously into uh, arterial infrastructure, water and sewage, as well as thinking more about how to secure a sustainable water supply for the future of Wyoming for both, you know, agricultural and municipal uses. Uh, with regard to the second question of uh, urban decay, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that that necessarily happens. And I think if anything, it becomes less likely if you have a, uh, you know, a free market forces determining what gets, uh, what gets built where. Um, you know, it, for, for example, uh, the city of, of, of Cheyenne right now, you know, uh, most of the housing activity that is happening, the new construction, you see a lot of it going up around the edges of, of the town, you know, when you're just driving around and that plays out in the data as well. Um, if, if it was relaxed somewhat to allow, uh, you know, not skyscrapers, but some more housing in the urban uh, area, the urban core of say Cheyenne, uh, you know, the, the demand that you get from people living there who want to go out to, you know, restaurants and coffee shops and what have you, I actually think that that mitigates against that kind of urban decay. And I think the worst kinds of urban decay, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, take San Francisco as an example, right? I mean, we, we don't want that happening in Wyoming. But the, a, a, probably the chief reason way beyond anything else that that has happened in San Francisco is because of the over restriction of uh, housing of, of housing regulations. They have massively restrictive housing regulations. It makes it very unaffordable to live there. It puts a lot of people on the streets. You can contrast that with a place like, uh, say, uh, Dallas in Texas and Houston in Texas, you know, places that are much more relaxed about their approach to housing. They make it much more based on free market principles uh, as, as opposed to, you know, a planner determining what can or cannot be built. And uh, I mean, you know, it, it ain't San Francisco. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much, Mr. Protzer, for being here. And I couldn't agree with you more that this is such an important issue. Um, thank you for your remarks as well. What got my ear in your testimony that I was hoping you could help me understand a little better is as you describe, you know, maybe kind of doing some baby steps towards this with the larger communities. What are you defining as larger communities? You've identified Cody, Rock Springs, and Gillette. In your as well as Casper in your materials, does that meet the criteria of of large communities, or what were you envisioning? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Delancey. 
Um, those were not meant to be the criterion for larger communities. That's simply demonstrating that there, you know, it's exemplifying that a problem exists. It's, it's proving a point that when you have these minimum lot size regulations in place, it creates a, a disconnect where the free market cannot supply the kind of housing that's being demanded. Uh, with, with regard to the largest communities in Wyoming, you know, I would, I would personally think of having conversations with maybe the top three or four largest places. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I, I would go beyond that. If, if any other places were wanting to have that discussion, of course, I would never say no to that. But at least uh, I, I would really focus on just the top handful of largest uh, communities in Wyoming to have that conversation. And, and it, again, not to ride roughshod over anything, but really to, to have that conversation, to bring people together and say, are there ways that we can make reforms to the housing supply so that it is more up to free market principles in a way that is going to be you know, politically acceptable. Hello? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One quick follow-up in the sense that um, one of the things that makes Wyoming so unique is our, is our agricultural landscape, our open spaces. And as, um, as I think about even the largest communities, one of the challenges that we have for expansion is you have very historic ranches that are pretty much you know, bordering our, 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 our towns, if you will, our cities. So has, you know, how, what's, what has been the thought process on, you know, when you have ranches that meet up against development, how do you reconcile that for growth when that's part of somebody's agricultural operation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Delancey. Um, so I, I think there's two aspects that you're getting at here. One is, you know, the livelihood of the people concerned, and one is the historic nature of what that operation means uh, to, to people who, who live in the community. And uh, I, I think the second point of those is the is, is the quickest to, to address. I'll address the first point with some, you know, economic stuff in a minute. But I, I mean, you know, you certainly wouldn't uh, pave over the Eiffel Tower, right? You know, uh, there there is uh, an importance when you have a cultural legacy in a place to choosing uh, some buildings. I, I wouldn't necessarily say you know everything, but if there are some buildings that have a uh, you, you know a cultural culturally significant legacy for the city, it's it's pretty normal to protect those. So if there are you know a handful of ranches that have been in operation for like 150 years or something like that, maybe maybe that's the the thing to do. Uh, um, with regard to the, you know, the first element of what I thinking, uh, I think you're getting at in that question, the livelihood of the people uh, concerned. Um, you know, I, I think again that leave, it, you know, if it's not a case where it's like a really historic thing that you want to preserve, and it's it's just a matter of livelihood, then I, I think again the most efficient uh, outcome is to is to leave it to market forces. Uh, you, you know, the, the people in question, they own their land, they're free to buy or sell. And, uh, you know, there's, there's really the question of, uh, should the government or their neighbors or whomever be telling those people what they can and cannot do with their land? What if they want to sell their land? You know, shouldn't that be up to them? There's, there's a sort of libertarian angle there. Thank you. Senator Rod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I like your last comment, the libertarian angle there. <laughs> Free market always figures out the best way to do everything effectively. Governments usually get involved and try to, you know, fix the problem and they create the problem. Um, <clears throat> we just went through, you know, some zoning amendments in rural Neutrona County that was <laughs> fairly contentious. The room was filled with <clears throat> constituents that uh, were against some onerous, you know, new amendments to the zoning. And, you know, I think it was 100 to 1 in the room for not doing the amendments and one against, but they still passed them. So you have that, <clears throat> that issue locally. I think <clears throat> the comments you made, um, you've, you've just got to, you've got to back off of the onerous regulations. I mean, it's, I think we have six counties in this state that do not have zoning laws at all. I think there's Johnson, Crook, Converse, uh, Weston, Washakie, maybe Goshen County. I don't know if you if you look at the data in those metrics versus the mo the more onerous counties that have a lot more restrictions. You know, a lot of people will say these rural counties are 
you know, they're rural, so they're not going to have the issues. It's easier for them. They don't have any zoning regulations. But one of the biggest cities in our country, uh, Houston, Texas, you mentioned it. They don't have zoning laws down there. You own your property and you can do with it effectively what you want. And uh, my view, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you take private properties rights away from citizens when you and hand them over to government agencies when you you make them too onerous. So thanks for your comments today. I think the free market just want to pound on that, get the government out of the way and let the free market figure it out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Ide. I, I would certainly uh, echo those views. So you would agree. OK, good. There was the question. I knew it was there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Davis. Thank you. <laughs> I have a, another perspective here. Uh, what weight was given to the cities or the towns and communities in Wyoming that are basically landlocked by federal and state lands? What's your way in on that? You know, as far as what you're saying, I'm, I'm interested to hear what your perspective is. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Davis. We, we did look at that issue. Uh, I, 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 I didn't mention it for brevity, but uh, what we found was that, you know, you can look using geospatial data at uh, different cities and you can overlay that with where federal lands are located. And you can see, well, where are the communities where this is really a problem, where a significant share, you know, you can draw like a circle around a city or a town or, or, or any kind of community. And you can just see uh, within a certain like donut around that, what is the percentage of uh, federal lands? And um, there, there are a lot of places in Wyoming that are sort of in the, uh, you know, maybe 10%, uh, even 20% even range, but it tends to be uh, very few communities and tends to be smaller communities that are really, truly, you know, boxed in, just there's, they're, they're completely uh, surrounded. I mean, the, the obvious example is, is Jackson, of course. Um, and, you know, so, so our thought on this is that, uh, this may be somewhat of an issue for some of the uh, smaller communities in Wyoming, uh, but for uh, some of the larger ones that uh, might, you know, even be more interested in a supply in an expansion of the housing supply to begin with, it, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily the decisive factor that is hemming them in. Further questions? Mr. Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Potzer, I really liked your presentation, and I, as Cindy agreed with, I agree with most of what you're saying. I'm from Jackson, Teton County, where land use planning is a full contact sport. I personally participated with a couple of other people in this room in three comprehensive master plans, one comprehensive master plan rewrite recently. Um, a lot of uh, zoning and, you know, as our community has gone through this, we have, everything has been driven by um, a fear of population growth and uh, clogging our transportation capacity. And we have created regulations for everything you can imagine, everything that you suggest we don't do, we do do. And, and I have fully participated in that listening to the professionals and um, and listening to our constituents. Um, we have, and, and I bring this up because there is a question at the end. We have um, actually completely underutilized our urban village areas, and we have managed to develop many golf course, high-end residential developments in our valley, and those seem to have gone through pretty well but workforce housing, affordable market, or um, high density residential um, is very, very difficult to manage to get done. And what we've managed to result in is um, instead of uh, protecting our city streets and our three arteries in and out of town, we have completely clogged them with 10,000 commuters a day, Monday through Friday. And um, so my question is, you know, maybe the cat's out of the bag in Teton County and Jackson, Wyoming, where government housing seems to be able to be built, but a reasonable, smart market private development is exceptionally challenged to be done. So what would you suggest for a neighborhood like ours? And I, and I do think in a, on a raw neighborhood, 
with an urban opportunity and surrounded by agricultural lands, your plans can probably work. Um, we do not only do the comprehensive mass plans, but we do all the neighborhood special presentations and we've created a whole industry of special interest groups to fight pretty much anything they don't love. So what would you recommend for a little place like Jackson, Wyoming? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is it Senator Barron? No, it's uh, just Mr. Mr. Lucky Barron. Me. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Yes. Uh, I mean, Jack Jackson is uh, certainly an, an interesting case. It is unique because it has the federal land surrounding it. I think that if you've got a situation where a golf course passes through regulation like that, and uh, housing that is supplied by the free market that should be affordable to regular people gets held up and held up and held up. Um, you, you, you've kind of got an advantage conferred there to the golf courses, don't you? Um, so it, it, I, you know, I'm, uh, I, I would think that uh, again, the best solution is to think about it from a, uh, a free market perspective, but probably incorporating the, uh, you know, the rationale as well that you undoubtedly do have these beautiful surroundings. I, I, I've been to Jackson for this project. I mean, the Tetons are stunning, Yellowstone is stunning. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you may want to consider, um, say, prohibitions on like skyscrapers or things like that. I mean, that would make sense to me. That would probably, uh, you know, not, not be particularly effective. But I, I think that you could similarly apply uh, deregulation in order to have more affordable workforce housing. I, I know of, I, I'm not going to name names, but I know of employers in Jackson who want to build housing for their workforce but cannot because they get held up by the element of the regulations that I'm talking about. That's the housing approval process. You get people who, you know, do not own the land saying, I'm going to tell you what you can or cannot do with your land. Um, and, th and that's a very inefficient solution. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, there are other it, ideas that are, are thinkable. I, not, I, I know a lot of people commute from Victor into, into Jackson. Uh, I, I have to wonder, you know, you've got so many billionaires up there. Is there no way they can pitch in to get like light rail going or something like that? I'm not, I'm not saying uh, tax them per se, but it, you know, uh, it, it might be something in addition to consider because you are boxed in so heavily by the federal land. Um, but I, I would certainly welcome uh, further conversations I, I would love to connect with uh, with you afterwards, and especially if there is a subcommittee, uh, you, you know, on this topic. I think that would be a fruitful discussion. Thank you. One more, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One last question: With the rising interest rates, how does that make it affordable? Uh, you know, I listened to one thing that said that it's cheaper to rent than it is to build to own. So. Where, where is that breakover point there that you would be thinking of in affordable housing? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Davis. I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. Ceteris paribus, higher interest rates mean less affordable construction, uh, and it just jacks up house prices. The reality is that, that you know, it's, it's not something Wyoming triggered. Uh, it's something that is just due to global macroeconomic conditions. Uh, and it's something that, yeah, it, it might not resolve for maybe even another year or two. And that's going to be tough. I think that if anything, uh, the durable presence of those high interest rates really highlights the importance of action on these other fronts because a big cost from developers, uh, you know, interest rates, those are one big cost because they've, they've got to finance their projects. But another really serious area of cost is the uncertainty that comes from some of these regulations. Uh, you know, when you go through the public hearing process and you have the public hearings and you have the protest petition laws, that means that developers have to price in a lot of risk to what they're doing because they may propose a project and they might get like halfway through it only to have it thrown out. So if there are ways that you can reduce costs for developers in the meantime, while global macroeconomic conditions take their time to resolve, uh, you know, then in the meantime, you're going to get more housing and more affordable housing. Thank you. Okay. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. With this, we're going to take some public comment. Do we have our folks online? Anybody there still? I promised I would. I think Rebecca Bextel does, and I think Jeremiah, we might want to hold until we get to the county presentation. Or if he does, that's fine. He can, I'll bet he'll chime in to me and tell me how wrong I am. But why don't we bring in uh, Ms. Bextel? Hello, can you hear me? 
Hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Beckstop. Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you, Chairman um, Guru and Chairman Nichols. <clears throat> My name is Rebecca Bextel, and I live in Jackson, obviously in Teton County. I want to say that comparing the golf, just really quickly, the comparing the golf courses to the people with the rights to live here in Teton County, I am 100% opposed to telling private uh, property owners what to do with their land. I do appreciate what the Regulatory Reduction Task Force Committee is doing. I would have hoped that the speaker had an example in the Western Hemisphere about where urban expansion was successful, or at least in this country. Um, so how I got involved in this meeting is here in Teton County, we've been told we need more affordable housing. Um, my friend and I, Blair, started a project called Save the Historic Teton County Fairgrounds and Rodeo. Um, at first, we started hearing about projects at 400 West Snow King, and that was very clever because a lot of people didn't catch that that was actually at the fairgrounds, the historic fairgrounds. Um, we ended up having 2,500 people sign a petition saying, please don't build housing at the fairgrounds, over 1,000 in Teton County. We had tons of volunteers uh, show up and, and ask that we not build housing there, that we protect the Western heritage here in Teton County. Through a public, public uh, process, we learned about uh, the Fairgrounds Neighborhood Plan, which a lot of people are now denying, but we have, we have proof of that. Um, we, we really fought, and I think we won public sentiment on not building housing at the fairgrounds. What we didn't anticipate was that an unelected bureaucrat in the housing authority apply for a federal grant identifying the fairgrounds as the place for low-income housing. We ended up giving a free 99-year lease to a private developer on almost 10% of our fairgrounds and the low-income housing piece only lasts for 30 years. So when, we, so, so when um, the presenter talks about how public comment can subvert private property owner rights, we had the opposite here. We had plenty of people saying, please don't build housing at the fairgrounds. Those are historic, we've had them since 1941. But then we had a lot of people that moved to town that would almost threaten the town council right in front of us and say, we voted for you to provide housing, provide housing. Everyone's welcome to build to come to Tijon County, but we shouldn't have to give up public land to do that. Okay, so um, first, if we bring back uh, if we bring back territorial jurisdiction rights here in Jackson, I'm going to be living in Tijon County, California, instead of Tijon County, Wyoming. Um, to, to comment on Representative Davis's comments, we've done so we've done good so far in the state of Wyoming by importing freedom-loving, hard-working citizens. There is no reason to start giving the ranch away right now. Who would we be making this affordable housing, who would we be making this housing more affordable for? And who is weighing in on this process? Um, I am against affordable housing just in general. There are plenty of good people living here right now making ends meet and contributing to Wyoming. Why do we have to, uh, um, in regards to the speaker's comments, why do we have to start enticing people here with affordable housing to move here? So for more specific feedback, when I see things in a presentation like, it's more than what we'd expect, more than what we'd expect, or um, than other US counties. You know, this is back to the climate change hoax. Sea levels are rising more than we'd expect. Well, maybe your data's wrong. Maybe, uh, Maybe housing prices are rising more than you expect, but it's not a problem with Wyoming specifically. I'm just wondering, I have, a, I guess, a couple of questions about that data. And then when we're uh, when we compare that to other U.S. counties, could we be cherry picking that data? Um, I know I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, I'm trying not to wing it like I normally do. I'm trying to go off cards here. Um, if you can wrap up, though, we'd really appreciate it. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would like to say that more people in Wyoming 
does not make it better. If that's the case, we'd all be sitting in New York and California right now having this conversation, how more people living here would be better. Um, also, the, the presenter said that he heard that 70% of the people in the University of Wyoming moved away to other states. Well, if they moved to California, they'll be right back. But where would they move that's cheaper than Wyoming? Did they move to uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma and where I'm from and Alabama? Um, Specifically, eliminating petition, uh, uh, protest petitions would have had the opposite effect for us in Teton County. Um, I understand we don't want to gang up on proper, private property owners. I agree with that. But in our case, we were trying to protect public property, and we got ganged up on by people that moved here yesterday saying they moved here to the wealthiest county in America, and now we have to give them housing that they're going to own, okay? Okay. Um, Urban, okay, the urban area density reminds me of the Joe Biden 30 by 30 UN initiative. I just wanna put that on the table. Also saying things like, let's let the free market decide goes against, directly against government funding. When I start seeing affordable housing, well, somebody's gotta pay for it, right? Is the next present, you know, are we moving towards getting the government now to pay for affordable housing for who? So to, to, to wrap it up, Chairman Girard, uh, group, please don't start passing out dollars to fix the housing problem. Like Senator Ide said, this could create more problems. Wyoming is the cream of the crop. We must protect it. Let's not turn this into some kind of a Biden 30 by 30 initiative where we're starting to move people into urban centers. Um, Wyoming's economic problems stem from Washington, DC. They stem from, uh, our current policies. It's not because housing's not affordable. People can still afford to live in a lot of towns in Wyoming. That's not our problem. We could throw a lot of money at something and still end up with the same problem, but we've changed the face of Wyoming. Um, government thinking that they can solve our problem is what's gonna turn us into San Francisco. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Well, do we have anyone else on there right now? Okay. Thank you. Next up, Wyoming Association of Municipalities. <coughs> All right. Who? <Ooh. laughs> For the record, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, David Fraser, Executive Director, of Wyoming Association of Municipalities, and um, I just want to—I just want to be clear uh, that my comments aren't going to be a aren't going to be resp a response to the previous presentation. But I'm going to speak more directly to the to the work of the task force. Uh, I would certainly, when I'm, I'm certainly when I'm done with my brief remarks, be happy to respond to any of that if you if you'd like to, me to. But uh, uh, I will start out by saying that uh, uh, I appreciate I appreciate what is and what isn't in the purview of the of this task force. Uh, having said that, I do need to let you know that uh, housing is a major pain point all over the state. Uh, I don't think that's news to any of you. Uh, I'm sure you're all feeling it in your own communities. In fact, as I've interact with all of the communities in uh, in Wyoming, um, I, I've been shocked by how you know what I mean, by how every single community seems to be dealing with this. Now, I will say, I will say as a disclaimer, there may be a community or two who isn't, but I haven't found them yet. <laughs> uh, even those that you would be surprised uh, to know are, are struggling with housing issues are. Um, so that being the case, and I and I can go into specific examples if you want to, but again, I'm going to try to st remain as brief as I can. Uh, at least in my initial remarks. Having said that, uh, our members are all in on finding solutions uh, to the housing problem. I will, I will uh, uh, say that, uh, you know, I give that to you with this caveat, is that uh, municipalities are tasked uh, with, with uh, protecting the public health and safety, uh, specifically as it, re as it relates to zoning, planning and zoning. Uh, you know, the cities provide water and wastewater services, uh, emergency services, and those are all, for example, and those are all things that are addressed during the planning process and, 
and during the development process. So there is a, you know what I mean, there is a need for those processes to, uh, in order to make sure that we're addressing those things. Having said that, uh, you know, I, I, as, a, as a recovering city manager, I remember having uh, discussions with my uh, department heads. I remember, uh, I mentioned earlier, I remember once uh, asking me the community development director to remind me what the name of his department was. <laughs> And he told me community development. I said, okay, so, so then you're supposed to be helping. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the chairman in some of his pre previous remarks really hit on that. And that is, you know, if there, what we really need is a cultural shift uh, to where, whether it's, a, whether it's a local government or a state agency, a cultural shift to where uh, we're mission oriented. And the, and the mission is to help uh, for these things to happen. And so, uh, to that end, we're we're in on that. I would I would uh, just give one caution, however, uh, particularly to the legislators in the room, and that is, uh, you know, if we if if at the end of this process we've streamlined the zoning and and building permit process, let's not think that we just solved the housing crisis. It's it's a more and again with respect to what the purview of this group is, uh, uh, just speaking to you more broadly in your roles as legislators. Uh, it's a multifaceted problem and 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 is going to require a multifaceted solution um, uh, along those lines we've wham has been working um, since prior to last interim uh, with a group of uh, and I won't try to name them all because I'll miss some uh, many are in this room but uh, a couple of dozen different uh, associations and agencies we've been meeting together regularly and trying to trying to come up with solutions uh, a couple that group has brought brought a couple solutions to the last interim, which didn't get, uh, get traffic. Specifically, uh, housing trusts and land banks, which were considered in the last interim, and really didn't get the traction that they deserved. But we continue to meet together regularly, and we'll continue to provide to uh, provide uh, proposed solutions to the legislature. And so, there's just a little commercial for that. And again, uh, bearing in mind what your purview is. Uh, this is just a small piece of what of what we need to address. So, um, I will tell you that uh, from our perspective, we have several of our communities who have begun to think outside the box. Uh, you know, we recognize that uh, uh, we recognize that we're asking for solutions, and we need to be part of the solution. Uh, we we uh, we haven't imagined yet all the ways that we can do that, but we are uh, working among ourselves, being the communities in Wyoming. Try to come up with solutions. Several Wyoming communities are uh, uh, have already. Se several are exploring, and several have already uh, approved accessory dwelling units uh, that would essentially, as a guest house on your property, that you could then rent. Uh, that's not. Uh, uh, you know, there are some. That is having some hiccups uh, in terms of meeting what what it's supposed to be doing. And in, in other words, uh, some are building them, but not but not renting them. Uh, we do have uh, one community uh, along the, uh, and I think I could probably name names, but we do have one community along the I-80 corridor who is actually uh, bringing a, uh, uh, negotiate, negotiating to bring a small, uh, tiny home manufacturer to the community. And along with that are approving a zone uh, for, for, for tiny homes. One of the, one of the major you know, uh, costs of building, of course, is the dirt. When you have large lot sizes, then you start with a large sum before you ever put a stick in the air. Uh, but they, they're creating a zone for that. And the company is intending to build a demonstration neighborhood uh, there for that. Um, now, uh, you know, that route comes back to zoning. You know, certainly you want to, uh, the community is going to want to have input on where those go and so forth. But, but again, we have, uh, we do have communities tr trying to get outside the box and think creatively about about how can you know what can we do to help solve the problem uh, i will uh i will say that uh you know uh again i i promise not to comment too much on the previous thing but you know in terms of of uh government transparency in the form of public hearings you know the local governments that, that's not always fun for the <laughs> for the local government you know many of you have served in local governments that's not always a lot of fun, but I think that, you know, but I do believe in, in, uh, in them and that everybody in the community has an opportunity to be heard. I'd have to have more information on what front loading that looks like. Uh, I'm not saying I'm opposed to that, but I would want to make sure that it's still 
uh, maintain the opportunity for everybody in the community to be heard. Um, uh, and I would just point out that uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the issues, which in addition to what is under your purview, interest rates, of course, is the the big elephant in the room right now. I live in East Cheyenne, and uh, we were they were just building, build. You know what I mean? On my way home, I'd see a couple new houses every evening, or you know what I mean, starting. Every, and uh, boy, the moment those interest rates uh, went up, it uh, it just ground to a halt. So that's. Again, not a problem, not, not something we can address even in this building, much less this task force, but, uh, but that's really chilling the entire uh, industry right now. Uh, one of the problems that we have in Wyoming, and it's probably more broad than Wyoming, but specifically in Wyoming, is just the availability of builders. You know, even in our, uh, we have, uh, you know, I mentioned that even the small towns are having this problem. Uh, uh, Matitsi has no long-term rentals available. Uh, because all of their rental properties have been bought up and put on Airbnb and other platforms as, as short-term rentals. Uh, and they don't have builders in that community. Uh, even those communities that do have builders, Laramie shared with me about a, about a year ago, I was in a meeting and Laramie shared, well, all of our build, we have build, we have builders in town, but they're all in Boulder rebuilding after the fire. And, and, uh, so they're just, they're just plain aren't enough aren't enough builders to meet the demand here. And of course, I'm sure they're, and I know they're dealing with labor shortages, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of how much, how thin their spread, the ones we have are spread uh, due to those. And of course, uh, supply chain and cost of uh, materials have been mentioned. Um, you know, I mentioned the, I mentioned the builders that were drawn away from Laramie to a larger market. That happens within the state as well. Um, and not just our state, I was visiting with my colleague from uh, Oregon, and uh, she shared with me that uh, the city of, I don't know if you know Madras, if not, you know Bend, probably. Madras is uh, less than an hour's drive from Bend, and Bend had a lot of building going on. Madras didn't, and they wanted to get some of that action in their community, so they actually waived all of their permit fees, all of their zoning and building-related uh, fees. They 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 zeroed them out uh, in order to try to attract those builders and they didn't come. And, and uh, you know, the market forces kept them where, uh, kept them there. So that's a challenge for a lot of our smaller communities. And of course, uh, most of our communities are, well, depending on who you ask, <laughs> uh, if you ask the National League of Cities, all of our communities are small communities. Uh, but just even by our own standards, uh, even by our own standards, you know, two thirds of our communities are under a thousand people. And, and unless people stop eating, uh, agriculture's not going away. And as long as agriculture's not going away, we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna be, have our folks spread out around the state and need those small communities uh, for, for the services that they provide, not only to their residents, but to the, but to the area. So um, I will say um, one last thing. Oh, I, let me say that I also appreciate what, what the previous speaker said about infrastructure. Infrastructure, as you know, is a real challenge here. We do have, uh, you know, the, the SLIB board does a good job at getting some of those out there. We were able to take advantage of some of our, uh, take care of some of our needs with some of the, some of the uh, COVID monies uh, that, that are going away, but uh, that will continue, uh, you know, to be a challenge for us, not just in big cities, but in all of our communities, aging infrastructure and, and, uh, and the cost that it takes to expand that is uh, is going to continue to be an issue so again not under the purview of this committee but when you're in your other committees please be aware of that and then and then lastly i think if i understand that jeremiah is on in the zoomosphere there and you know if i didn't say something uh to raise jeremiah's blood pressure i just wouldn't be doing my job so um extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, has come up, and I know that's a hot issue. And I, I missed the. Uh, I hired on recently enough that I missed the battles over that the last time that it came around. But I, but I do know they must have been significant because I know that the feelings are still thin <laughs> on both sides uh, of that issue. And and uh, I don't, I don't. So I can't comment much on what has happened there. But here's what I can say: is that uh, in areas that are in the county. But that are likely candidates for future annexation, uh, we it would be good if we had some if we had better 
incentives to cooperate for the, for the cities and the counties to cooperate. Now that is happening uh, some places. Laramie, I know, is just uh, in the final stages of uh, putting together a, uh, a plan with the county, with Albany County, in terms of some of those uh, ex, uh, you know, areas outside the city. And that's fantastic. Um, not all of the counties uh, and cities work so well together. So again, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, anxious to open that can of worms, but I would say it would be good if there were better incentives to work together. With that, I would take any. And, and Jeremiah, you're welcome uh, for teeing you up for, uh, to lose your marbles when you present. I'd take any questions. Questions, Mr. Frazier? Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank Wham. Okay. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Riemann, are you out there? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do it right. I apologize. We'll get right there to it. Good Jeremiah. afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Mm -hmm. It's great to see a lot of uh, very familiar faces uh, online and in the room there and appreciate the opportunity to join you remotely. Certainly, the counties uh, are well represented amongst uh, the membership of this group. Uh, by my count, uh, there are, what, at least four uh, former county commissioners and the former director of our own association there, uh, and uh, great to have you as part of this. I want to ensure you that our intention uh, as you move forward is to be productive partners in addressing a variety of issues. You've heard a lot this afternoon about uh, housing. Uh, that is a critical issue at a number of our communities, a growing number of our communities. Uh, but I know that uh, as well, uh, we're attempting to ensure that we can be better uh, responders uh, to uh, economic development, business growth uh, in our communities, and, and we want to be uh, there with you. Uh, the great thing about uh, counties is that we have the ability to react very quickly uh, as uh, issues come up. Uh, and where our regulations might be a hindrance, uh, we can move through that process uh, to ensure uh, that, uh, again, we are uh, those productive partners. I've provided you with a document that outlines a number of the uh, areas uh, relative to. Uh, zoning and, and local ordinances at the county level. I won't go through the entirety of, of that document, but I do think it's important to, uh, to note a few things. Uh, first, uh, unlike the municipalities, uh, the counties uh, operate under what's uh, tr traditionally called uh, across the country the Dillon Rule, uh, which means that uh, we are only uh, able to enact those regulations uh, that one are expressly granted by state law or the constitution, uh, two are necessary uh, and implied from that power that you've granted to us, and three uh, that are crucial to the existence of counties. And there's plenty of case law uh, relative uh, to that particular issue uh, in the state of Wyoming. As it relates to local zoning, uh, of course, Counties must have a comprehensive plan. That's a requirement of long ago, and all 23 counties do have a comprehensive plan. But as Senator Hyde said, uh, uh, there, uh, you know, the next step in the, the, the level here is then zoning uh, regulations. And not all counties have zoning regulations. Um, we're currently working with Wild Pass to be able to provide you with more substantive information around what counties have. Uh, zoning regulations in place for all of the county, portions of the county, et cetera, and we'll get that to you. Again, just because we can have zoning regulations doesn't mean that we do, uh, uh, and uh, not all counties do. I do want to just note that there are 
some counties that are exploring portions of that particular issue a bit more uh, out of the pandemic, uh, you know, sales that we've seen, et cetera, and, and uh, a number of different uh, uh, you know, people coming into the state with the expectation that they buy land, uh, and then, then services are going to be provided in certain parts of the county, whether that's for broadband or many other uh, services, fire, water, et cetera, and that they want to subdivide that land. So there are uh, more counties uh, considering what their role is in ensuring that people are on proper notice of what services may or may not be provided uh, because uh, your neighbors don't necessarily want to have a responsibility to pay for your decision to buy that rural piece of land. Um, there are a number of limitations relative to a county's uh, ability to uh, zone. I've noted those in the document. They include things like we can't zone uh, uh, the um, reasonable occupancy uh, for extraction and production of minerals. Uh, two, we can't uh, infringe on the zoning authority of municipalities. I'll get to extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, here in a minute. Uh, there is also uh, a limitation around residential and agricultural uses that might be uh, de determined to be exempt under other parts of our subdivision requirements. And then, of course, in 2019, we added a limitation relative to private schools. Uh, in all cases, uh, subdivision of land certainly is a limitation uh, or a regulated uh, activity that does come before boards of county commissioners. And there are a number of different things that uh, are considered there. Of course, uh, lot sizes, uh, division of property, including roads, easements, uh, utilities, et cetera. And, and the document uh, explains that uh, at great length. Um, I did want to uh, uh, just note, as I mentioned a couple of times in the document relative to extraterritorial jurisdiction, it too precedes my time uh, at the association uh, as, as it did for uh, Dave. But in 2018, the legislature did make some significant changes relative to uh, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. In particular, uh, if a county uh, has adopted uh, a comprehensive uh, plan, uh, then it is not subject to uh, the county lands, the unincorporated lands are not subject to extraterritorial jurisdiction. I did want to suggest, uh, I know there was some comment about uh, uh, incentives uh, for cooperation. Uh, I wanna say that it's actually a requirement that already exists in state law, because when that change was made, there is a provision uh, that the counties must notify the city and seek comments on issues like street alignment, water, uh, and other things that are critical uh, to uh, that uh, particular issue. Uh, I would say, uh, as uh, Mr. Protzer, uh, suggested. Uh, he's absolutely correct that this will be a difficult issue to pursue uh, amongst my members, uh, depending on uh, what that conversation uh, might look like. Uh, I would just say that uh, uh, one of the concerns that comes to my mind as I listen to the conversation uh, here today is the very real possibility that we could end up in a situation uh, where we introduce the very limitations to growth uh, that exist in our municipalities by uh, forcing that conversation outside without appropriate uh, limitations as exist today. There are a number of other areas where uh, uh, counties do have uh, regulatory control. You've added to those relative to wind and solar energy solar energy uh, development. Uh, you uh, also afford us uh, latitude in liquor licensing. Historic horse racing is another example, and that one is one where we have very limited uh, authority. Industrial development uh, is another. I would agree with many of the panelists here that it is important that we continue to work towards uh, uh, state and local partnerships to address some of the issues. I've heard water come up 
a number of times. If we're talking about Laramie County, I think that's one of the most critical issues for us to address and, and continue to work on when we look at the fringes of uh, the Cheyenne community and being able to work on density uh, issues. Again, we're here to be productive partners with you, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions, and we are very happy to continue to work uh, towards uh, uh, finding uh, answers to any questions that you have, data that you need uh, in order to complete your work. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Jeremiah. Questions? I just have one to think about for both WAM and, and the County Commission Association. And it's not a question I have to answer now, but just something to think about as you go forward. One of the things that I've gotten input from is would commonality, more commonality in building codes across counties and across cities and commonality in licensing for contractors? Would that be something, you know, right now, some contractors feel that, you know, like kind of shifting sand. You know, I go into one county, it's one thing, one county, another regulation. Commonality going across the board, if there be a way to try to work on that as a goal, whether through a committee like this or even of themselves, to bring something forward to try to help do that, that, that might that might help kind of grease the skids a little bit, help help the way for construction efforts and more people to come build an estate. Something to think about as we go forward. Other questions? Comments? County Attorneys Association. Jeremiah, are you speaking for those folks too today or they got somebody on their own? Not that I'm aware <laughs> of, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Question, Senator Culp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Jeremiah, general, I guess, an observation from being a county commissioner for eight years and being really uh, in the front lines of the extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, argument and, uh, and, and the, I guess the result of what had happened currently. Would you, I, would you, what would your opinion about the, the major benefit of counties and cities cooperating, which they do do through notice, is uh, street alignments. I, I don't know about building codes, that involves building inspectors and such, but street alignments and such and utilities going out into the county, you know, I, I don't know, it may, it may be some low hanging fruit um, as, a, as a conversation going forward, but uh, I certainly don't want to resurrect the dead with uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. I, I like to keep that dead, dead, dead. And uh, just your comments about what we can do to cooperate between the cities and counties for development moving out into the county besides the cities just buying land that is undeveloped. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb. I think that, it, again, it's it's not a matter of incentivizing that to happen. It should be happening. Uh, it is a requirement. It is an important and critical component of this whole conversation. If we can't spend a dollar once and make it mean something, uh, you know, why should we spend that dollar at all? Uh, I would be concerned if we're not having those conversations that we're going to have those misalignments and be spending more money uh, in in this uh, effort. So whether it's uh, street alignments, uh, utilities, water, uh, et cetera, those should be conversations that our communities are having uh, to ensure that we have proper growth uh, uh, within our jurisdictions. And, and from the conversations that I've had, uh, I, I do think that's happening. I do think that there is uh, more work that is happening, uh, let's say in Laramie County uh, and, and uh, with the city of Cheyenne. Could there be improvements? Sure. Uh, and, uh, uh, but yes, I absolutely agree. That should be part of the conversation. Other questions? Ms. Delancey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mine is a little bit more of a comment uh, on the WCCA materials submitted by uh, Mr. Riemann, which it's great to see you. Mr. Riemann, thank you for being with us today and adding your insight. You always have such good guidance for us. Um, having uh, Looking around the room, I just wanted to build upon the um, comments by our chairman as far as that ability to uh, collaborate, yet also kind of reserve some individuality in um, the counties and cities working together. I'd like to go back to, we've done this before and we did a really good job at it. And we, Mr. Hamilton will probably remember this. I know Senator Bebout remembers this, but when wind energy and minimum standards for construction were upon us and came upon us in Wyoming very quickly, 
the way that we were able to work together in figuring out, you know, giving the counties uh, the flexibility to uh, responsive, do responsible development, but yet at the same time maintaining their own individuality based upon what their needs are, was we did it in Title 18 in the sense that through the subdivision statutes in the in that kind of where wherewithal because that way we set a, a minimum standard for construction. So to the point made by Mr. Protzer, you know, like developers do not want to assume the risk of you do it this way in this county, you do it this way here. You know, like the, the minimum standards of construction was kind of put everybody on notice that said, if you're going to build a wind farm, Mr. Parfit remembers this too, I'm sure that, you know, that this is the floor. Now the counties had the ability to kind of go beyond the floor if there were some local nuances that needed to be addressed. But um, I think that that was a very good piece of work that we in Wyoming did together. And I just, you know, if, if that conversation does evolve out of this task force, I encourage us to kind of think back to how we approach that model of really trying to make sure that what, there was some continuity and, um, you know, some consistency in our approach to regulation. So my point is we've done it before, we can do it again. Mr. Riemann highlights that, you know, again, the, the, the minimum standards for construction in his materials and, and I, you know, I think that that might become something that this task force might want to refresh and take a look at as far as going forward. Thank you. Don't you agree, Jeremiah? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Once again, I look you over to staff to see about the attorneys association. I didn't see anyone on there before. No. Okay. So public comment, and I'm sorry, I, I was so riveted on listening to one of my own Teton County citizenry talk and learn the course of no good deed goes unpunished um, that I uh, forgot to even look out in the audience and see if there were other cognitive comments and there are and please come up and I apologize for missing you. Problem. Mr. Chairman and committee, I'm Jesse Defoe, the policy director for Freedom Path 307. We're a nonprofit organization committed to advancing pro jobs and conservative fiscal policy. And knowing um, how tight your timeline is today, that a lot of these great points have already been made, there's just a few that I wanna reiterate as hopefully you really are thinking seriously about a subcommittee for the task force. Um, and one of that is that while there's been a lot of great um, comments towards the Jackson and Teton area, we know for sure that this isn't just in that area of the state. In fact, I appreciate Wham earlier coming up and speaking. I love to quote their study of 88% of communities reported needing more of this affordable housing and over 70% saying that because of the lack of housing, they weren't able to attract or grow new businesses. Um, I also appreciate the comments um, about worrying if Wyoming is going to become urban and what happens if that becomes the thinking there. And many of you know my, my prior background and how committed I've been to educating our youth and how much um, I'd love to see a place for them to come back to where we don't lose that type of Wyoming culture and value. So I think that the big question is what can we do about housing? And I think that this regulatory reduction is you know, the right way to go about it. And always tending to those free market values is what's going to have the most effect of what we'd like to see done. Um, as you look to set future agendas, I think that there's two common themes that continue to come up. And one is creating incentives for affordable housing. Maybe that's a rezoning and production targets that if counties go ahead and look into those, then maybe that's how they start receiving state funding is creating more of those incentives. And then also what regulations do you take off the books? What barriers you know, are there to supply? And how do we ensure that timelines are actually met that are set? So really, how do we increase the consistency and limit the uncertainty for those who can make this housing supply issue solutions um, practical for Wyoming? So with that, I'll answer any questions, but thank you for the time to comment and let you know that all of Wyoming is seeing this as an issue. Mr. Chair, uh, you uh, just just dawned on me. You know, uh, affordable housing is isn't that kind of the kickstart for a young person? Is affordable housing? What's next? Is affordable housing forever, or is the family and the four bedrooms and the big backyard and the swimming pool? And I mean, 
so what are we talking about here? Affordable housing for how long or what's what's next down the line? Sure. And Mr. Chairman and Representative Davis, I couldn't have asked for a better question because in full disclosure, I had about 10 minutes worth of comments and I could tell that that may not <laughs> go over very well. But, but one of um, the sections of that was to share that I think that many of us in this room had a similar trajectory. I know I personally started out in an apartment, then a starter home, then to a nicer home, ultimately to the home right now that my family and I really enjoy. And it's a, it's a multi-set process to get people there. However, currently what's happening in my community and many communities around is that these dream homes are being built because that's where our builders see the most profit and there's the most consistency. And they know that that's where they can spend their time and resources. So I think that when we look at deregulating and ultimately zoning, you know, these 30 to 40 units on um, a 10 acre lot doesn't mean careless neighborhoods. I think if we have certain beautification standards, thoughtful investment, it's, it's not a forever solution to be in that type of um, affordable housing or starter home. But when we string down the supply for those entry level homes, we don't have workforce housing. We don't have a way for them to save and move on to those dream homes. And so unfortunately with what we've done with our supply is create a real problem by not letting the market grow like it needed to, to support every facet of where we hope Wyoming families will have a similar trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. There we go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the task force. My name is Dan Dorsch. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you briefly, very briefly, uh, uh, wearing three hats today. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the, the Management Council for creating this task force to look at regulatory reduction here in Wyoming, specifically for housing, and I hope that um, a subcommittee for housing regulation and reduction will be created. The first hat I'm wearing to you today is the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity of Laramie County, which is a nonprofit developer and builder of affordable housing here in Laramie County. We create home ownership opportunities for people who normally wouldn't have that opportunity because they couldn't afford a traditional mortgage. And that betters our community because when they have a home, they stay, they, they live where they work, they play where they work, and they pay when they work which is economic development. They pay property taxes and they're providing a community and benefit the community that they're living in. And the reduction, in regulation, uh, the reduction of zoning regulations in the development process would be beneficial not only for affordable housing developers, but for-profit developers as well. Because when, when we hear the issues we're talking about, um, expansion, water issues, we want to encourage people to build up, not out, and, and use infill in, 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 in within city limits. And I'll use Cheyenne here as an example, but um, those are the, that's the type of in, look, incentives we're looking at to help build up, not out, and save money and, and infrastructure costs. Second hat I wear today is uh, as a member of the Affordable Housing Task Force that Mayor Collins, uh, Mayor of Cheyenne created. Um, I want to thank the Business Council and the Harvard Growth Labs for, for their uh, Pathways to Prosperity report. Um, because in the almost two years now that I've served on the task force, it's the third time that we've seen a report that recommends these deregulations and stream, streamlining of the development process. One was from the Affordable Housing Task Force here in Cheyenne. We presented to the city council five zoning recommendations, uh, eliminate density maximums, eliminate single lot family minimums, eliminate height restrictions on single uh, multifamily units, reduce or eliminate rear setbacks and uh, eliminate uh, the 30% brick and stone requirement on multifamily housing here in Cheyenne. Um, it was also, the, all, the same recommendations were also put forward in May of 2022 by a, a uh, engineering, engineering uh, excuse me, a Denver University engineering student capstone project. His, his project was uh, finding barriers to housing in Cheyenne and he said the same things, that we need to eliminate some of those zoning regulations and streamline the development process. And then the third hat I wear today is just as a citizen of Wyoming and a concerned citizen because housing is a large issue and a concern to me um, in this state and a barrier to our economic development as a state. Um, when I hear stories of hospitals not being able to hire 
um, master electricians because their family can't find a place to, to live here in Cheyenne. That's a concern. When I hear University of Wyoming professors can't afford a place to stay, uh, turn down jobs because they can't afford places in Laramie, that's a concern. So um, we, there's a lot of talk of workforce housing and over the last several years that workforce we've deemed essential. Our teachers, our nurses, our police officers, our fire departments, these people are having trouble affording a place to stay where they live. And so if we deem them essential, then their housing should be essential as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Guru, uh, Co-Chair Nicholas, and uh, Task Force members. I'm very aware that it is a privilege to speak with you here today, so I'll be very brief. Brenda Burkle, Executive Director for My Front Door. I am a nonprofit uh, developer as well. I happen to work hand in hand with Dan Dorset Habitat. We uh, serve the next uh, income uh, segment in that housing continuum. We are very supportive of the work uh, that will take place within this group and sincerely hope you do have a uh, subcommittee that works on, on the issues uh, in depth. And I did notice that there is no uh, nonprofit developer representation. We certainly would always be available at your disposal for um, maybe a little understanding as to how these regulations affect for profit differently from nonprofit developers. Um, for example, um, while it's not something that this body would regulate, but nonprofits often work with sums of funds or grants that require um, contractors to be SAMS registered and to run a payroll that includes considerations for OMB and all that good stuff. This definitely adds cost to us. And if that exists, I'm sure that there are other things on a state level that do exist as well. Um, I appreciate uh, Chairman Perkins' comments about being able to have some um, uh, common sense approach and flexibility um, from agencies as they um, consider problems and, and applications. One thing that I would, would be very um, focused on is, for example, the paperwork that was submitted with the Arizona example, and they listed very specifically that um, are we applying these regulations fairly and appropriately and equitably across the board? In some cases, that's not true. If you look at the agencies as they promulgate rules and, and procedures, those can then go downstream and are interpreted differently on a local level, and they're not applied fairly across the board. Um, that would be one area of focus, and I know that there are many others. Uh, having served as the chair of the Mayor Collins' Affordable Housing Task Force and Dan as my co-chair this year, uh, we certainly could be a research uh, information or um, source of data for you. Don't hesitate. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, Senator Ide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. Uh, your nonprofit status, Habitat for Humanities, where, what are your primary sources of funding? Where does that come from? And is it mostly, you know, government uh, grants or is it private sector? Just comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ide. Uh, most of our funding is from the private sector, uh, just private fundraising and other grants from private entities as well. We do rely some on federal grants, but hardly uh, a small percentage of our budget comes from federal grants. And, and part of that reason is, as being a smaller affiliate, um, we don't have the capacity to write and manage those federal grants um, as some larger organizations do. Um, a lot of those, um, the ones we do uh, write for are from a city level, the, the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG, that does come from HUD, but comes to the city of Cheyenne directly, which we apply for and we put to good use for affordable housing. You're welcome. Senator Cole. Chairman uh, Guru. Chairman. So, Chairman Guru, I'm so I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you want to, uh, Chairman Guru, through you, uh, Senator Ide, I, uh, we are different organizations, so I can answer from my agency that we reserve the, we receive less than 2% generally of grant funds from government or fe state or federal sources, with the exception of um, the one and only CDBG application that we received uh, last round. But other than that, it's philanthropic endeavors, quite frankly, shaking the can. Thank you, Senator Cole. Thank you again, Chairman. Uh, 
probably two different answers here to this question. So I want to just ask an open-ended question is, what's holding you back? I mean, you're, you're there, you know, have a mission and you're trying to do this mission. Apparently you haven't been successful as you'd like to be. What, what's your major impediment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, through you, Senator Kolb, uh, we have been successful. I can, I know that Dan has been very successful. I can say that our organization has helped 59, 59 families become homeowners. We have a seven-year program model that begins with financial literacy and culminates in five years of stewardship for homeowners. 58 of those 59 families have been successful over the long term. What holds us back is really a growth in impact and making bigger numbers uh, and ensuring that people experience economic mobility. That economic mobility really leads to fewer interactions with law enforcement for the children, greater economic or greater um, health outcomes over their lifetime and greater academic achievement. But we're in real estate and it's expensive. On top of that, it's not just the home ownership that's the piece, it's also the direct services that we offer to the families in teaching them how to fish. They are in large part uh, products of generational poverty. They are working families. I deal with um, families that are 50 to 80% of area median income with children. They are working families. The 80% of area median income, to give you a perspective, a family of four, the ma that maximum of $74,500 here in Laramie County and 74,300 in Albany County, we operate in both. So really, um, it's a matter of funding. Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb, uh, we too have been successful since 1991 when our affiliate started. We've, we've built 51 homes with homeowners, and, and since 2016, we've completed over 70 habitat repairs projects, which isn't building homes, but it is helping low-income individuals, main, usually uh, either uh, senior citizens on a fixed income or disabled people on a fixed income, or sometimes both, stay in their home. So if they need, uh, if they become disabled and they need a access to their home safely through a handicap ramp but can't afford that because they're on a fixed income, and as we all know, costs have gone way up over the last several years, we can come in and help them put that handicap ramp in their home so they can stay safely. Um, I will also say our 2017 homeowner is the perfect example of why our, our programs and programs like Habitat and My Front Door are, are beneficial because uh, Giovanna Vasquez and OCL Luna were renting um, they had to work two jobs each to afford that rent because usually rent is much more expensive than a, a mortgage. And they didn't have a lot of time spending with their family and their family struggled. Their kids were struggling and, and they were unsafe. When they became a Habitat homeowner, they built their home through 400 hours of sweat equity right alongside our volunteers. They received a 30 year 0% mortgage, so they do pay a mortgage, but it is 0%. And, and now, six years later, uh, Giovanna is a nurse at the VA. She is in schooling right now to even better her career at the VA. And OCL owns his own business, uh, a very successful gutter and siding business who, who's giving back to his community and paying property taxes and, and the very model of breaking that cycle of poverty and generational wealth. So there are successes. Uh, the holdbacks are funding and, and some of that comes to infrastructure. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we, we have property right now, 0.93 acres on Story Boulevard called Pronghorn Crossing that has sat there for three years since it was donated to us because we can't afford the infrastructure. It was platted in 2014 to provide 17 units, five single family homes and three quadplexes. But the development cost to put all the infrastructure in because it's not connected to city sewer and water is roughly 1.5 million. And that's only for 17 units. So there's a barrier right there. Secondly. What, what could theoretically happen if, if the Cheyenne City Council were to pass some of these zoning regulation changes, we would be able to double our unit from 17 to potentially 34 or 35. So we could maximize that land and put that many more homeowners on it and put that many more families in a better position to, to help the, their economy and local community. Senator, I so just a quick follow up. You mentioned uh, zero percent financing. Can you give us a little background? Is that through a bank or is that through Habitat? How, how do you get zero percent financing? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ide, that is through Habitat. We are the mortgager. We provide that um, 
mortgage to them at 0% because we offer a hand up, not a hand out. It's not a free home, but we understand that these, these families, like I've mentioned before, wouldn't be able to afford a traditional mortgage. And so we give them that little break, that little piece to help them afford that mortgage and to better their families. You're welcome. For the Mr. Chairman. Ah, Mr. Ah, Senator, yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your comments. It's sort of interesting. You could double the number of units if the City of Council of Cheyenne would, would move forward with some zoning changes. Uh, maybe that message will get out to them. The question I have is, in, in terms of the money you spend, what percent would you say is allocated towards like G&A expense? I'm sure most of it goes into the home and the ground. What percentages are those? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, excuse me, Senator Bebo. Um, it, it depends. Former, home, former senator. Former senator. Excuse me. I apologize. Always. Um, <laughs> it depends because it depends on the land we get. Sometimes we purchase our land, um, and other times it was it's donated to us, and those costs are associated. Uh, uh, depending the the mortgage that we provide depends on the cost of the land and how we acquired that land. If, if we had to purchase the land to put the homes on there, then, then the expense is more. But if we get it donated like it has been in the past on several occasions, then it changes that way. Um, I, is that answering your question? Well, Mr. Chairman, yes and no. I'm just curious, you know, a lot of times when you have the NCO, there's criticism of so much money goes into overhead, but at least up here in my community, Habitat seems to be putting most of the money towards the the home and what you're trying to accomplish. And I just wonder if you had any any input as to what other communities like Laramie and Cheyenne might be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, further comment is? Yes. Senator Crew, thank you. Um, and Mr. Bebout, thank you for the question. I can kind of give you a little bit of perspective from our point of view. Um, an average family of four at 80% of AMI is 74,500 roughly. Uh, and that puts them in the ballpark purchase range of 250 to 275. Uh, and what we were finding for our purposes is here in Laramie County, an average lot went for 85 to 150 thousand dollars. It might be down since then. Um, that was kind of at the height. But if you think about what it costs to purchase um, and what it costs to build that home, the percentage or the cost of land is is pretty significant. We are a little bit different in, than Habitat in that we don't do a sweat equity model. Um, we use a community land trust model, which captures any subsidy that we get and then retains them in perpetuity, keeps the home permanently affordable. But um, when you think about overhead as opposed to um, development um, for organizations, every organization that's a nonprofit is mission driven and we try to keep that very, very slim. Okay, further questions? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Okay. One more public comment. We're going to take one more and then we're going to move forward. There we go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the task force committee. My name is Lisa Murky and I'm here on behalf of the Wyoming Realtor Association. I am a real estate professional. I've been in the um, industry for 12 years. I'm a responsible broker and I've served on our state leadership team for seven years and now I'm um, a national director with the National Association of Realtors as well. I serve on the uh, Federal Financing and Housing Opportunities Committee. And so this is definitely near and dear to my heart. Thanks for allowing me to speak today. Our professional trade organization, of course, is uh, wholeheartedly about protecting private property rights and then promoting home ownership with uh, availability, accessibility, and affordability. And uh, we understand, you know, regulations exist to create standards and protect the public, ensure that everyone gets treated equally. Um, however, I would like to give some local uh, ordinance and zoning examples um, from my community. I'm from Laramie, Wyoming. And um, Sometimes the overreach and lack of flexibility from those who oversee and implement our regulations um, currently are preventing us from being effective in, in not only new construction, but also in existing housing. 
And one of the examples that I'm sure you might be aware of was uh, last year, Laramie passed a rental ordinance, which was meant to increase quality standards for renters and hold rental owners responsible for the condition of their properties. Um, unfortunately, it lacked a lot of standards and procedures, leaving doubts within the public regarding its intent, the feasibility, the fiscal solvency, non-discriminatory application of it, and how it would ultimately affect our community. It wasn't uh, until a private party sued our city that it was deemed unenforceable and um, unconstitutional. However, uh, after some adopted amendments by our council, the rental ordinance is still in effect. And what it has caused is many private property owners to refuse to register the rentals, um, turn them into short-term rentals that can double their profits, whether they're on Airbnb or just going month to month. And it's a loophole to avoid compliance with the regulations. But what it does is it takes more affordable um, opportunities for rentals off the market. And the other thing that it does is um, it created standards that go above and beyond what current code was when the house was built. And so effectively, those costs that the owners that are compliant incur are being passed along as much higher rental rates in a community that already has very high rental rates. <laughs> So while the intent is good, this type of local enforcement is a prime example um, of just, you know, passing regulation for the regulation's sake and not really understanding the, the unintended consequences. Um, we're in a college town where we're 50% owner occupied and 50% tenant occupied. Uh, with just over 13,000 housing units, we have about 7,031 rentals is what I pulled from our county assessors before our meeting today. We've only had 1,038 registrants of their rental properties. There's a $100 fine per month for not complying, but it ends up being cheaper than the $7,500 egress window you're required to put in. So while I think that the intent was good, obviously um, many people did not get on, on board totally with this rental ordinance. And um, we, we have tried to take it to a state level and um, you know, we had Representative Zwanaker last year that presented House Bill 216, and um, we didn't really get any traction at this point, but we're, we're hoping that the state will pay attention, especially with this task force on how, you know, local ordinances can affect the affordability of housing. We are 1,200 units short according to the $150,000 study that our city has done, um, and developers and builders are discouraged from working in, in, our, um, in our county. Right now, the poor perception and reputation of working with the city, um, just because of regulations and timelines, has been uh, really difficult. Our company, we are seeking inventory. We love to sell. We command 50% of the MLS in our marketplace. And so we, we go to bat trying to find uh, builders that will come to our community. We've talked to at least four builders in the Cheyenne area, um, trying to get them to come over and build and, and uh, build ready lots that are there. And um, our city's done a great job of smaller lot sizes, in increased density allowances, um, different zoning considerations. However, because of the perception of working with our city, um, one of which is, well, how long does it take you to get a permit? And we're like, well, about five to six weeks. And they're like, well, over in Cheyenne, I can get one in like seven to 10 days. You know, we understand that it's difficult to work with your city, you know, even though Many of us have adopted at cities across uh, Wyoming, you know, either the Unified Development Code or the International Building Code or the guidelines that they have. Most of those follow with, with or at the engineer's discretion. And I think it's just really critical that we empower and, you know, demand or expect our professionals that are in these positions to really use discretion. Um, interpreting some of these clothes just black and white and not giving any uh, flexibility to other considerations makes the cost really incredibly expensive. Things such as detached versus attached sidewalks, things such as um, aesthetics that cost tens of thousands of unnecessary dollars. Um, one thing that we have in Laramie is we have one spec on a fire hydrant that's $4,000 more than the average fire hydrant. So there are things that um, I think that we could work on. 
Um, I think that's already challenging, like I said, to get developers and builders to come to uh, invest their time and effort in our community with slimming margins. Building supply costs have come down a little bit. However, delivery costs have gone up. Labor hasn't come down in our town. Uh, infrastructure has not come down. Uh, the latest developer I spoke with said that uh, now the utility companies, dry utility companies are now gouging them um, for gas, electric, internet, things of this nature where they used to provide and bring these services in because they knew that they would have a future of customer base to pay for that. Um, they're no longer providing that. And so this developer just had written a check for $800,000 to have electrical brought in. So I think that you know, it's really important for us to act in the spirit of uh, cooperation, be flexible, give these guys incentive to want to come and build in our communities. And uh, that's, that's going to sum it up. I appreciate your time today. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What do you attribute the overzealous regulations to in your county? Why have they gotten so bad? Why does it take you five weeks to get a permit versus, uh, you know, a week in, in Laramie County versus Albany County? Mm -hmm. Can you sort of speculate or zero it down to leadership and city council or county commission? What is that? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Ide. Um, from my understanding, our city is only capable of handling so much. And they sort of have this number in their mind of where they'd like to land each year of, of how many permits they approve and, and what that number is already kind of preconceived notion in their minds. Um, whether we could expedite that with additional staff, um, that would be a great question for them. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, thank you.
Okay. Okay, we're back. And now we're going to hear from some of our friends in the in industry. And we're glad to have you. We're going to start with the Wyoming Mining Association. And I know you've been waiting patiently all day. Thank you so much for being here. And make sure we're back online. The floor is yours. Okay, the patient part might be a little dubious, but <laughs> Chairman Guru, Chairman Nicholas, and members of the task force, my name is Pat Joyce, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Wyoming Mining Association. We appreciate your inviting us here today to uh, visit with you about a few issues. Uh, I always say when um, the legislature calls and they want an expert advice, I look around and usually there's someone with a lot more expertise and knowledge than I have. So I've invited uh, Philip Dins Dinsmore to come in today. He's got a lot of history and a lot of knowledge of it, how we've ended up with a lot of the regulations that we have today and I felt that it might be more appropriate to have him come in, maybe more effective, more efficient. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Pat. Chairman Gro um, and, and Co-Chairman Nicholas, uh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity, the pleasure to, to talk to you today. My name is Phil Dinsmore. I am uh, currently located in Crook County, Wyoming, where I am happily retired from the mining industry, 43 years in. Um, and in those 43 years, I uh, was lucky enough to have spent three to four years with the Department of Environmental Quality Land Quality Division, uh, and in 38 plus years with uh, largely the coal industry in Wyoming, and also the coal industry uh, for a couple of years in the state of New Mexico. Um, during that time, I had the uh, unique opportunity to stand up the coal program in the state of Wyoming uh, at a time when we had a four or five year old uh, regulatory program. Then a federal law came in and the state was challenged with whether or not they wanted to take primacy or that coal regulatory program or not. Obviously we did. Uh, so um, those are some of the things in my background. In the 38 years in the industry, I spent uh, a considerable amount of time in environmental engineering, regulatory compliance, engineering, and uh, it, pardon me, and uh, reclamation. So I, I kind of covered the span of opportunities uh, or uh, experiences in the, in the field. Uh, the Wyoming Mining Association wrote you a letter on June 12 and identified five or six items that they considered some of the most important with regard to what your challenges appeared to be. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on those five or six points uh, for one main reason, and that is that you have a very knowledgeable and articulate person on your committee in the in the person of, of Ms. Olson over here. And I think I would be just taking away uh, time from her when there's perhaps a couple of other thoughts I can share with you that might be uh, more valuable. Um, out of those five or six items, there's really one underlying issue uh, that, that uh, ties them all together, and that's the issue of staffing. Um, Wyoming boasts a, a world-class mining organization. They have world-class coal production. We have world-class uranium, bentonite, and trona production. Wyoming also boasts world-class environment. We have these two things together. And that doesn't happen if you don't also have world-class regulatory agency and program. And I believe we have that. The problem we have right now is that that program is having trouble keeping staff. It's having trouble getting staff, and it's having trouble retaining staff. Those are two separate issues because you can hire people, 
And if they stick around for less than a year, you never even complete the training. If you don't complete the training, there's nobody on that staff that has any retention or any institutional knowledge uh, that carries with it some of the most important aspects of our regulatory program. And I'm going to pull out one of those as an example. Uh, it goes to the questions that came out earlier about primacy. It goes to the issues of staffing, and it goes to the issue of retention. One of the comments in the Wyoming Mining Association letter uh, goes to the annual report. The annual report is a requirement that came out in 1973 in the Environmental Quality Act. And the requirement back then was each operator that gets a mining permit will report annually to the Land Quality Division on certain uh, issues regarding that operation. And over the years, maybe the numbers of issues that have come up have increased. And certainly as the, uh, as the operations have aged and gone from their uh, in opening operations into full-scale reclamation, and in, in many cases, bond release now, the amount of information that gets reported back to the agency has increased simply as a result of where we are in our, in our process. But early on in the process of gaining primacy with the Office of Surface Mining, uh, we found out that there was no, uh, con no uh, federal requirement for an annual report. So the, the first conclusion is, well, if we retain this requirement for our annual report, we're going to be more stringent. And should we do that? But we also found a requirement in the federal law that said uh, each permit is issued for a period of five years. But that uh, five-year period is going to be split in half, and we're going to open the permit up after two and a half years and relook at it. And we in Wyoming, <laughs> I can toot my own horn, we got kind of smart and we said, let's convince the federal agency that our annual report is actually more stringent than a, than a two and a half year uh, permit reopening. Because the fear is that if we go to a two and a half year permit reopening, we're going to spend five straight years permitting. Because it's a, it's a two year process. And it's never going to end. It'll just be constant. Well, my experience in New Mexico 20 years later tells me we were exactly right. And we won the argument with the federal agency. So when you look at it on the surface, we're more, we are more stringent than that federal law. But we're better off for it. And there are a number of those kinds of issues that are embedded in the Wyoming program, especially for coal, that, um, that we want to be careful we don't lose that institutional knowledge about. But we're in danger of doing that because of the turnover at the, at the De Department of Environmental Quality. So again, I point back to the importance of that staffing issue that Mr. Harfit talked about earlier this morning. That, that may be the single most important thing, in my opinion, that you can do for, for the department. I think that um, unless there are any questions, I will stop there and, uh, and let, let you know that if there's any other questions or if there's anything we can do, we would be happy to. Well, thank you both very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. There's more questions. Questions? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question for the gentleman that's worked both in New Mexico and in Wyoming under coal. I'm a little bit familiar with some of the things New Mexico did. I, I Maybe you could share with me, I, as my understanding was New Mexico is not where we want to be. And is there something we can learn from what they're doing down there that we're not doing or we don't want to do in terms of moving forward with this task force? Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bebel. I, I think the, the answer is I was not particularly impressed with the program in New Mexico. Um, I don't think they took the bull by the horns as Wyoming has done. I don't think that their objective was to have world-class mining regulation and a high quality environment too. And that's where they are. Um, I, I wouldn't, I don't know of anything um, that I would recommend that this committee do or not do 
uh, that New Mexico has or has not done. Again, it, it wasn't, I only stayed two years. I, I, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> Further questions? Senator Ed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, another quick question. How does, how does Wyoming stack up uh, worldwide as a jurisdiction um, or just in, our, in, just in our nation as far as regulatory uh, burden on the mining industry? Is, are we, you know, in the top 10 percent? Are we the best? Are we, do we have a lot of room to, to work to get to number one or where are we? Stack up on that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Dried, my opinion is that Wyoming is near the top of the, of the organizations. And there are a couple of reasons that I say that. Um, in the old days, when I was working on the Wyoming coal program, I studied a lot of the other states. And, and this is many years ago now, but I knew something about those regulatory programs. And in almost all cases, they were very adversarial. And they didn't accomplish well there is not the the uh, the outdoor environment in many of those states that we're blessed with here okay so that they, they're protecting their resources but perhaps not to the degree that that wyoming is secondly i look at what's happened over the last 40 years since we've had that program and and i see that wyoming is when there's an issue out there between the, the federal agencies and then the state agencies, oftentimes the finger pointing goes to Wyoming. Let's see what they're doing. Let's talk to Wyoming. Let's get Wyoming people on this national task force or this, uh, the IMCC, for example. We've been leaders in that organization and, and so on and so forth. And that tells me something too. That tells me that people are looking to Wyoming and seeing that we're doing it right, or at least in a very desirable way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Parfit. And this isn't a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do appreciate all of the, uh, the time and effort that you put into making a, a solid uh, coal mine program in Wyoming. I do have a question for you related to the relationship uh, between the mining uh, industry, uh, mining association, and the DEQ, has that uh, worked well through uh, the uh, different work groups that we have, or are there things that we should be looking at to improve that relationship? Mr. Chairman, um, Director Parfit, I have a, um, a perhaps uncommon opinion about that. I have always believed that we need to have a healthy adversarial relationship between the agency and the industry. I believed that when I was employed by the agency, and I believed that when I was employed by the industry. And, and the reason for that is we, we need to be questioning each other. Um, and I believe that is a kind of uh, generalized relationship that has existed uh, at least since I began back in the 1970s. Uh, that changes, of course, with personalities. It changes with um, uh, the, the director and the various um, uh, administrators within the, within the Department of Environmental Quality, but it also changes as the personnel within the mining industry change. But I, I think that it can be safely said over the long term that we have held that um, relationship, that kind of uh, arms distant relationship where we work together well. And a very good example of that actually was started about uh, 2010 or, or 12, somewhere in that time frame, where we began a process of having working groups. And they were formed in each of the mining segments, Trona, Bentonite, Coal, and Uranium. The working groups uh, would meet on a monthly or quarterly basis with members of the land quality division. And some of the meetings have been rather contentious. Some of the issues have been um, uh, hotly debated, uh, but I don't know of any issue that has come up in any of the working groups, any of the four, that hasn't been resolved somehow within that 
within the, the framework of those meetings. And so the fact that we can do that, we can work together to solve an issue uh, without having to go to a legislative change, for example, or a rule change, although sometimes rule changes are the way that goes. Uh, the fact that we can do that, and here we are 12, 13 years later, and we're still having those working group meetings, tells me we've got a good relationship and a good working opportunity, and we've put those together to solve problems. I hope that answers your question. Further questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Stensborn. Thank you. Joyce, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Obermuller. Well, thanks with the Wyoming Petroleum Association today. Glad to see you. And the miracle of Zoom and other electronic means you just appeared. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Pete Obermuller, Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Um, I have listened with great interest today. It has been interesting, apart from quickly dive into my foxhole when extraterritorial jurisdiction was mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that. Just a little swelling there. Been, yeah, yeah, right. A little twitching going on, but it's okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for this opportunity. Um, so I, I think a lot of it was talked about when uh, Director Parfit was uh, at the desk and, and um, uh, Senator Bebow brought it up as well. And um, I, I would say that I'm particularly glad Senator Bebout's on this uh, committee um, representing oil and gas. Uh, there's probably not anybody who's better situated to talk about regulatory impacts on small operators in Wyoming than Senator Bebout. I think you know, some of you would be interested to to learn that uh, a, a full third of Wyoming's oil production in the state of Wyoming is produced by about 400 companies that individually produce less than 2% of the total. Uh, so we hear a lot of rhetoric about big oil. Um, we really just have Wyoming oil for the most part. Um, none, the, 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 most of the majors do not operate here and even the larger operators are independents. So uh, it's an important topic. As Senator Bebout alluded to, and others, most of our regulatory headaches come from our friends uh, at the federal level. Uh, and uh, dealing with those is not something that this committee can, can necessarily do. We talked about uh, this in, in previous committees and, and at the Select Federal Natural Resource Management Committee earlier uh, last week. Um, it goes so far, Mr. Chairman, on that part to um, that, that federal regulatory actions drive our own regulatory actions that are headaches so for example the one that is troublesome right now is um, uh, the governor just put out uh, for public comment over the next two weeks a pretty significant expansion to sage grouse core area and uh, uh, something like 1.2 million additional acres of sage grouse core um, our our Sage Grouse Core Area Executive Order uh, already captures about 80 to 83 percent of the birds in Wyoming, and so another 1.2 million acres might get us to 85 or 86 percent or something like that. 87, we're reaching the point of diminishing returns. But the fear is that if we don't do something, the federal government will do something worse, and so those their, their actions drive our actions here too, and that is uh, that's a difficult thing to overcome. Uh, but we'll keep working on it with your help. And uh, I think uh, somebody mentioned, um, uh, I can't remember who earlier today mentioned the ability of, of the state and the state AG to have enough personnel to work on these issues. And, and that uh, is critically important to, to us as well. And we will back you know, any effort to make sure that, that uh, the state has the resources it needs to push back on these, on these federal efforts. Uh, moving closer to home uh, very quickly, um, to be honest, Mr. Chairman, the regulatory environment that's really state driven for oil and gas industry is is uh, not terribly onerous. Uh, we have um, we have a, a good relationship, not always super friendly, but we have a good open relationship with Mr. Parfitt's uh, with Director Parfitt's agency and also with uh, Supervisor Cropatch. Um, but it's uh, when we have one off regulatory issues, we're usually able to work them out. Sometimes it takes legislation like we did um, when we overhauled the permitting rule a couple of years ago with OGCC. That was a big lift. 
Uh, but we did it because it needed to be done and we were able to come together and make that happen. Um, at OGCC right now, one regulatory issue that we've been looking at, um, uh, as we consider how it's becoming, it may become increasingly difficult to drill new wells in Wyoming, that it's important to make sure that we have our, our legacy fields be able to stay open and active. And, uh, and, and part of doing that is having a bonding system in place that does not discourage investment in our legacy fields. It's a tricky issue. I know the OGCC and their staff are willing to work on it, and we're, we're interested in that one um, as well. I would be remiss, however, Mr. Chairman, if I didn't say that it's not generally the regulatory structure that keeps people away from Wyoming and oil and gas. Um, for Wyoming specific issues, again, set aside the federal government, it's more taxation. Uh, we often talk about Wyoming being the number one, um, has the lowest tax rates, best business climate uh, as it relates to taxes. That is true for every industry except for oil and gas, where we are among the highest, if not the highest uh, in the nation. So we, it's more of a tax issue, which isn't this committee's issue for, for us, but uh, uh, but that's one that obviously concerns us. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to engage uh, as you um, move into subcommittees and all of that uh, over the course of the next few months. Thank you. Director Rubin, uh, questions? Questions? Senator Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Obermuller, thanks for being here. I'm with you on both counts. You know, the federal government seems like that's our Achilles heel on everything. They own half of our state. You know, we're like calling us out here to the crown 2,000 miles away. And uh, how we get to the root of fixing that, there's, I guess there's ways, whether there's a will to get there or not. The second one, on taxes, you know, minerals is obviously the golden goose for our state. And if we keep letting Washington uh, wrench us down on moratoriums and sage grouse and, um, you know, we need to find solutions to that, those issues. I, I guess my question to you is, is on taxes. I mean, what do you suggest there? Are you looking at more tax parity? I mean, we had a lot of tax bills coming up. We're going to have more. We got a revenue committee coming up here in a week uh, to talk about those issues. What, you know, as, as a representative for the oil and gas industry, what are your comments on how we deal with, with the mineral tax that you're obviously saying is one of the biggest problems? Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator. I appreciate the question. I know that's not the purview of this committee, so I won't spend a ton of time on it. Revenue will work on it as well. Um, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, well. There's so many. It's, I, I'm, I'm running through a list in my mind. I think the Revenue Committee will talk a little bit more about personal property tax, which I think is important. Uh, I, I, my association is working on um, this year, as as so many of my members uh, are. Um, uh, working toward carbon capture sequestration, uh, carbon capture storage, that there is an opportunity for Wyoming to uh, 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 to help incentivize that, that new direction. Um, it's not a um, substitute for what most of my members do uh, in terms of hydrocarbon production. It is additive and it has, uh, a, and we are um, we are out of the gate before so many other states on it, and, and we can really help to, to move that forward. So we'll, we'll come with some ideas there, too. Uh, uh, so it's, there, there's a lot there that we could spend another day on. In fact, we will spend another day in your committee. And you will. And you will. <laughs> Further questions? Comments? Sir? Sure. Sure. I figured. Sir? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And and appreciate your comments, Pete. The, the thing, we understand the federal impact and what they do and, and, and the big scheme of things, that's a tough one. Our governor can fight, we can fight in Congress and try to do what we do in that arena, but very difficult. But the thing that I have under the regulatory framework that we're talking about, given the, the tax situation is what it is, given we have the permitting delay, given the EIS of all these negative things, 
Whereas in other states, you don't have to deal with it, particularly small operators. You know, in Illinois, the, the severance tax and ad valorem tax on oil is zero. You know, you have the, the, the differential that we have to pay for. So my question, Pete, is given all these negative things we have to deal with as producers, particularly small producers, what can we do in the regulatory framework to help us in some way ease the pain? Is it in the bonding capacity? Is it uh, something about stripper wells? Is there something we could do to try to incentivize so it's so small operators like me will stay in Wyoming rather than go to Oklahoma or Illinois where it's a much more favorable climate tax-wise, permitting-wise, regulatory-wise? Is there some ideas or some things we could work on in that arena? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Bebel. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot there, and uh, as I mentioned, I think you probably know um, the the bonding situation, particularly with idle wells. We we have we have a lot of idle wells. They're they're not plugged. We don't want to plug them because there's a resource that can still be accessed, but then it needs to be economical. And uh, and the uh, uh, the cost of idle well bonding does not help to incentivize. Uh, restarting those the, that existing infrastructure we already have that doesn't require new development, uh, and and so I think that's actually a big one, uh, Senator Bebel. That could help smaller companies that want to invest in in smaller legacy fields and bring back to life some of our uh, existing uh, oil and gas uh, infrastructure in Wyoming. Um, on the uh, you, you mentioned. Um, you know, some other uh, production incentives, stripper wells and those sorts of things. I, I think Senator Bebel, we need to, to renew our focus on enhanced oil recovery. And I think one of the ways we do that, I didn't go down to the weeds on it to the previous question, but one of the things I think that we can explore, uh, Senator, is that the federal government is heavily incentivizing through their tax code, uh, permanent carbon storage. And I think Wyoming can help actually level that playing field to help uh, to, to help incentivize taking carbon and using it for enhanced oil recovery, uh, as opposed to permanent storage. Not that permanent storage is bad. We're going to need that too uh, in this economy moving forward. But but focusing our attention on enhanced oil recovery uh, could could be uh, really could be a game changer for Wyoming. One follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. One of the things that, that I think we, we do in Wyoming, and, and, and I'm not necessarily opposed to what we do, but on the, on the regulatory side with the environment, we really go a lot further than I think a lot of states, and, and, and I'm sort of proud of that, but it's very expensive. If, if you drill a well, you can plan on maybe 15, 20, 25 percent of your cost would be in doing your, your, to get your permit and doing your environmental impacts and all of those type of things. Is there a way we could utilize that cost to incentivize against our cost to drill the well that might make sense to, to, to may have more people, particularly smaller operators willing to drill? If all the money you spend on permitting and environment, if you could maybe get maybe off that against your severance tax or something like that, an incentive for us to drill. Mr. Chairman's certainly open to that discussion, of course. <laughs> I figured you might be. All right, thank you. Ms. Delancey, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Obermuller, thanks for being here today. Um, I recently got a email about changes to sage grouse core areas. So I just wanted to check in with you on how are things going uh, as far as uh, SIGIT and uh, migration corridors and some of those aspects um, going go well for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um... Uh, Ms. Lancy, thank you for the question. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, that um, Sage-Grouse core area is a state, uh, as you, most of you know, is a state-led conservation effort uh, to make sure that uh, the Sage-Grouse are not ultimately listed on the Endangered Species Act. Um, uh, wildlife, are, of course, um, it is the charge of the state to manage wildlife when they're not on the Endangered Species uh, Act list. And so it is uh, beneficial for the state and they do a, a, a great job. Uh, in managing our wildlife pretty much across the board, uh, you know, notwithstanding weather events like the winter we just had in, in, uh, in terms of large ungulates. Um, and I think if you look at what has happened with oil and gas development as a result of the executive order on sage grouse back during the Friedenthal administration, you can see pretty clearly that it has worked. 
that it has uh, it has allowed for development to flourish outside of core areas, and uh, and that development has happened. And in core areas, you can still develop there, but you really have to uh, be very intentional and methodical about doing so. Uh, and the, the argument then and still is now that it's not necessarily about the number of birds. It's about uh, making sure that we have the appropriate habitat and that developers uh, operate in a way that maintains the habitat so birds can thrive. So what troubles me about our current uh, effort in adding 1.2 million acres is, in my mind, it seems as though we've flipped a little bit and we're looking at just adding numbers of birds instead of looking at the core habitat that would do the best for the population writ large. And I understand that they're under pressure from, from the BLM uh, uh, on this, but I'm, I, I feel we've reached a point of diminishing returns on adding more acreage, uh, acreage. And we'll see how the public comments. It's, to answer your question directly, it's in public comment for the next two weeks. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll see where it ends up after that in terms of uh, adding acreage to, uh, to core area. Great. Thanks for raising awareness about that public comment period. OK. Thank you. Before you go, I uh, just want just one thing too is as you going forward, you have to answer this now, but just going forward, I know you, know, you talked about federal regulations and what we can and can't do about that. But as we look at them and then look at our own regulations, as we go through this, just see where, you know, once, you know, if there are anything that we can do to streamline that to make sure that we're not overlapping processes or timing issues or things like that um that's been mentioned to me in a couple of, in a couple of uh instances where things that we could do just think about those and if any comments that you make towards that not now but you know on you know as we go forward we'll do thank you mr Chairman. okay thank you okay appreciate that anything thank you, else Chairman. on that okay before we go here to the next turn i'm getting the wool grow to we're going, to take One a, minute. Yeah. we're going to take just a sufferance <laughs> of the chair here or sufferance of the co-chair who has to leave us yeah. uh, comments for the co-chair so i i have to run down to denver because it's my daughter's birthday this evening and so i'm heading down um but I just you know, we'll, we'll finish the, through our our comments here today um what what we envision is we're probably going to divide into working groups um the task force one will be energy one will be um, housing regulatory issues, and one will be agricultural issues. But what, and what we foresee is we'll finish taking testimony today. Um, if there's any additional testimony or issues that we want to ask um, any of the parties who have presented, or if the, any of the parties that presented wants to provide us more information or background materials, um, uh, then we would entertain anything that, that wants to be submitted. If, um, and what this group will do is we'll, we'll have a Zoom link so, so we have to re, re, kind of regurgitate all of the things that we learned here today, decide if there's any more folks we want to interview um, before or after we, we create our working groups. Um, we'll want our input on what working groups um, you're, you'd prefer to be on. Um, and it, ultimately, the, the chairs will decide that because people got to go someplace. Um, uh, but the, uh, I appreciate all the testimony and everything. We've got, we've got a long way to go. Our goal is to get something definitive done by October, and to set up a framework so we can continue this, as the governor talked about, or the lunch hour, and uh, of having a continuous process so that whatever we do, um, we turn it into a regular a regulatory review um, system to continue to improve uh, um, efficiencies of our government. So I apologize for, for leaving early, but uh, please continue, and I'll be um, on the Zoom and listening in, but I probably won't comment again. So thanks, everybody. Thanks. Okay, so that's kind of like a challenge to say something controversial enough to get him to say something between now and Denver. Okay, so we all know what our charge is. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Without further ado, <laughs> the Wyoming Stock Growers Association, welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today, and we certainly appreciate that the agriculture industry is well represented by two gentlemen that are on the task force. So uh, we, we look forward to working with them on that. Uh, as, as I start out, just a couple of, of general comments, and I've observed this over time, that the legislature can pass a piece of legislation that calls for some rulemaking. 
and depending on the understanding of the issue, et cetera. And I've seen agencies approach that from the perspective that, okay, this is a regulation, it's control. We need to put the parameters in place to control this activity by this industry. Or, and I've seen this just as much, they can approach it from the attitude that we need to create a framework that will enable the affected interests to function better under this law that's been passed. And I, the difference between that can be dramatic. And there's, I believe, in all fields, plenty of examples of both. And uh, so I think that as you look at this, part of it is looking at regulations. But I think a very important part of it is looking at how we prepare the people that we employ in state government to deal with this burden that, that we're placing on them. And you know, if you look back in time, historically, uh, most of these state agencies were stra staffed stronger than they are today in terms of numbers of personnel. Uh, if someone who'd been doing a position and it was not unusual for 30, 40 years, uh, step down. Uh, there was someone who'd been working under them who was well prepared to step up into that role. What we've seen in recent years so often is that because of rapid turnover of personnel, that uh, the drafting of regulations, certainly implementation of regulations, is being put in the hands of people who have no background, no experience to do that. They see and perhaps understand the rule. What they don't see and understand is how the implementation of that rule impacts the constituency out there that that uh, they're uh, affecting. So I think that putting some focus on whether, whether it's a general training program within state government for employees about uh, regulation and that, or or some help to individual agencies, that some emphasis on that would be very helpful, along with looking at the regulations themselves. With that, just to mention a few of the things that have focused, at least at this point, in our mind from the ranching industry, uh, the one at the top of the list necessarily is state trust lands, because we've worked very heavily on that the past couple of years. The legislature has stepped up and passed a numerous bills this last session that address some of those problems. Uh, we're working on with, with the Joint Ag Committee on one additional one that I think will help even more as this process moves forward. But there again, it, it causes me to ask the question, uh, some of those regulations have been in place for over half a century. Why did they work well for 30 years and they don't work today? Is it, is it changes in our culture? Is it changes in the agency? And, and I think those questions are worth asking as you move forward with this, not specifically with state lands, but with any of the uh, agencies. So with state lands, of course, we've been focused on leasing processes, which seem to be broken down on the complexity of forms, which, you know, a form that started out 40 years ago is one page, about every 10 years grows by another page. And pretty soon you've got a, a five page form to fill out for something that should have been able to do with one page. Uh, notice processing as we moved into the electronic age and agencies haven't kept up with that payment methodologies. Again, using state land just as an example, today they are not able to accept credit card payments for leasing fees, that, and that's one that we're attempting to address. And of course, the staffing issues that I've talked about, and the, just in general, the lack of, flexi lack of flexibility that needs to be addressed. So in, in the case of that agency, I think we're making good progress. Uh, they've certainly suffered through lack of personnel and, and shortages, and legislatures addressing some of that as well. Uh, in the short time frame we've had, we've reached out to our membership. We haven't had a tremendous amount of feedback on what particular regulations are impacting them. I'm sure we'll get some more as you go along with this. But aside from state lands, uh, uh, a couple that have come, uh, one with regards to DEQ, certainly that I know we've experienced over the years, I've experienced personally even, is that because of their primacy, they're having to be guided by the federal rules. Their process for stream classifications is extremely complex and cumbersome to move forward with. And then if a stream gets classified and is found to be impaired, the, the process that you have to go through to prove that it's no longer impaired or to change the classification uh, goes on for years. And, and that's probably just an example of other problems within DEQ that they're faced with because of their uh, primacy. But uh, it's one that we would like to see uh, addressed uh, in that agency. Uh, 
Uh, in the Department of Agriculture, Director Miyamoto discussed the meat processing and food safety, the Food Freedom Act. We know what the parameters are there. We're all concerned about safety, but we're also always looking for, particularly uh, in the past few years since the pandemic and that, where there's so much more interest in local production, buy your food by from the people you know. I believe there's still some things we can do, being careful that we don't get in, in trouble with the feds, but that we can do to make that process more viable for willing consumers and willing producers to do business together directly. So we, we would like to see some, some focus there. Um, Sagegrass plan has been mentioned by others. Uh, it certainly is one I've been getting calls about recently, that ex significant expansion of acreage of core area. And in our case, the primary issue is, and I'm not prepared at this point to say that expansion is needed or not needed, or how much it should be, but so much of it involves private lands. And I think that the process that was used did not reach out appropriately to the private landowners up front. It's one thing to put a map out that has all your ranch suddenly is core area and then make you have to challenge it. It's much better if before you put that map out, the, whoever the infected interest is, whether it's in this case Game and Fish or Sage Guys Implementation Team, goes to those private landowners, sits down with them and says, we have some indication that maybe some of your land needs to be incorporated in this. What evidence do you have that would support this? What concerns do you have? It's just a way of doing business that in the haste of getting things done sometime, and in this case, partly driven by federal pressure from the BLM, that we failed to build those lines of communication. And one thing that I emphasize often to, to a variety of state agencies is uh, our ranch community is what we are. We're, we're rather enclosed. We're rather, you might, some would say, we might say we're selfish, but to say we, well, we took care of you, we had a public meeting, that doesn't work. You need a meeting where you sit down with the landowner, with the rancher, and talk about these things. And so I think that's another area where there's some room for uh, improvement. Uh, so as, as you go forward with this, we certainly there are some regulations we'd like to see you look at, and we'll come forward with some more details. But I think really looking at the process, how we get regulations, how they're implemented, is equally as important as looking at what the regulations are. And finally, in closing and looking what other states have done, I, I took note particularly that uh, the governor of Idaho successfully got them down to only 3 million words, what we're at 4 million. Uh, the governor of Idaho happens to be a longtime personal friend of mine. And I would love to have Wyoming and our governor challenge him that we can get our number of words of regulation below what you've got. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to take any questions. Mr. McGagna, thank you. Questions? Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jim. I always appreciate your comments and your wisdom. Um, I wanted to just visit a little bit on the water quality standards and you, you uh, correctly stated the importance of how those standards get set really are, uh, as it goes to uh, impaired streams and what causes an impairment and how you define that and then how do you get out from being an impaired stream uh, is a long and arduous process. Uh, so it's important to get the standards correct. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask or make sure that you are aware that uh, we've been working on that very issue with the triennial review process process with water quality standards and i don't know if you've uh, had any communication with our folks but uh, we expect to go out in the third quarter uh, of this year to public notice um, so i would welcome your input to see if we've captured the concerns uh, and anyway are you aware of that that's a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Director Parfit. Yes, I am, and your people have reached out to me on some of that. I won't say I've been as engaged in it as probably I should be just because of other factors and other things on the plate, but uh, I am aware they're looking at that, and uh, hopefully we can, we can do some meaningful things, and as you get closer to coming out with something, uh, please let your, your staff know in water quality that we want to work with them closely on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Jim. Uh, as as Todd stated, always always welcome the input, and you and I have had many conversations about the evolution of of uh, the needs of Wyoming ranchers. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, do you see anything 
what would be the most important task that you could see for the for the Department of Ag to undertake to try to advocate for for Wyoming's ranchers today? Is there something glaring that sticks out to you that we should be working on? Change in focus, anything? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Director Miyamoto, I wouldn't say a change. Uh, certainly, the and and you've been working on it some, and we certainly are. I mean, from and I'm speaking from the livestock side, and certainly. Mr. Hamilton speaks some of the other components of ag, but uh, on the production side, I think we do really well in general. I mean, we have our problems with regulations and that. It, it's more on the ability to, to market. And so uh, the meat processing is huge. Uh, we've made some tremendous progress with your help and that of others in the last three or four years, but we need to go further. We need to get some things, which hopefully we're moving toward on a scale that's larger than what we have to date uh, to make this work for Wyoming producers. And, and that's involved a, a long process of changing the attitude of our own uh, producing community. Uh, traditionally, we thought of ourselves as producing steers. And when the steer got on the truck, our work was done. We're learning, and it's not been easy for some, that what we're producing is the beefsteak that goes in front of the consumer. And we have to be involved in that chain of, of development distribution processing right down to the end and then so anything you can do there that would help i i would welcome uh, i looked the other day doug and and maybe you and i should look at this together sometime this goes back 15 years ago the department of ag developed a, a long-range plan we spent a lot of time on that and like so many long-range plans it went on a shelf and there it sits at least I still have a copy. I don't know if you do, but it might be worth taking a little time to go back and look at that. A lot of it probably isn't applicable today. Uh, maybe it wasn't the best of all then, but it had a lot of good, solid thinking into it. And we may be able to to garner some some ideas on some other things we can do from there. And I would certainly, Mr. Chairman, mentioned the business council. They've worked very well with us too, and I think we have a lot more opportunity uh, there as well. And they're they're critical to the type of things we're trying to do to create the markets for our products that are dynamic and that enhance the return to our producers. Further questions, Kyle? Oh, this one scares me. Jim, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've talked a lot about things and housing issues and things Some of the things we talk about in the class, like we looking down the road. Do you see other entities out there that we need to be able to work on? That's the I'm sorry, I didn't push my mic. I apologize. Oh. Do you see other issues down the road? Uh, that agriculture should be working on that maybe haven't been talked about at, at this initial meeting with the eye towards an ongoing discussion about, well, what are some other things? Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Hamilton, certainly there are. You mentioned game and fish. Uh, we feel we've got a very good working relationship with them, but they have some constraints on themselves, constraints on what we can do, but constraints on themselves that need to be addressed. For example, we're dealing with the elk issue right now. Uh, another one uh, you mentioned, or I believe you mentioned transportation, or I've thought of transportation. Uh, it's not huge for us, but there are some issues with regards to the requirements for moving farm equipment and uh, livestock trucks and that. And some of it's federal, but some of it has some basis in, in YDOT that I think we could address there. So uh, if, if you look at the entire agricultural operation and the ranching family or the farm family, uh, you know, there's not much in not much in any agency in state government that doesn't impact this. I mean, certainly other fields like healthcare and that uh, rural, anything that affects rural communities, uh, education, just reading today about Albany County was proposing to close two rural schools and that uh, caused quite a stir in the rural, which is largely agricultural community. And we've actually been working over there to try and get another additional school opened up. And instead, when we read that they were considering closing too, that uh, makes us pretty uneasy. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Senator Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just another quick question. This is maybe too hard or too easy, one of the two, but if you were to tell this committee, this task force, what your members think is maybe the number one or number two, the top two things to discuss as far as you know the Wyoming stock growers goes to on this task force. What could you nail that down, or is there too many to to describe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ide, that that's not an easy one. Uh, a year ago, I would have said state lands because that was just overwhelming. But as I say, we're we're not there yet, but we're making significant progress but but i think the other thing that, that we can't ignore and you can't ignore is anything in the regulatory field that just impacts the integrity of rural communities we see these small rural communities which we're dependent on just gradually fading and then, i mean some have faded since statehood and we're long gone but but a lot of them today so anything we can do that recognizes that they need some certain amount of flexibility to to function as a community that's very different from what Cheyenne and Rock Springs and Casper need. And I think that would be an area that's worthy of some consideration and give them some, some added flexibility and perhaps even some tools that will enable them to, to better uh, survive and hopefully thrive. Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McGagna, I had a question to go back on the sage grouse uh, expansion. Uh, so if I get if I understood you correctly, there was no input given from you and your association on on any of these expanded areas uh, as they develop this plan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb, not from us as an association, and I wouldn't expect that you know, as an association, we would have strong input on specific areas of designation. We would reach out to our people. I, I will say Game and Fish early in the process came and sat down with me and talked about what they were doing. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, being driven by the desire to keep Wyoming ahead of the BLM so that they don't take over designation of habitats in the state. But uh, as I understand this, and it's been a little confusing who was in charge. Uh, Game and Fish has not been fully in charge. The sage grouse implementation, SIGIT, has been largely in charge. The local SIGIT groups, and there are five of them, I believe, in the state, they certainly had some meetings around the state that were open to the public. But again, if I'm a rancher that's out there busy taking care of my animals, and particularly this year, just trying to keep them alive, and I hear that the local SIGIT groups meeting someplace someday, uh, and I don't know that they're going to be talking about something that impacts my land, I'm not likely to try to find time in my schedule to go show up at that meeting. So some some advance notice to people, some phone calls or something. I mean, it's uh, recognizing that we're talking about the relationship with private landlords, I think, is what's been lacking there and is often lacking in these processes that just needs uh, a little more attention. And this task force as part of your work might well be able to provide that. Okay. Anything more? Mr. McAgna, as you, Mr. Of always, thank you very much. Next up, the Wyoming Business Alliance. Mr. Chairman, yours. Uh, Chairman Grew and Chairman Nicholas, if you're on the airways somewhere, members of the committee. My name is Rob Hendry. I'm the chairman of the uh, Business Alliance, and we're glad to be here. Uh, chairman Grew and, and Chairman Nicholas, thank you for having us. Lauren Benford, I'm the vice chair of the Business Alliance. We're here to give you some a few thoughts and and uh, uh, the task force. It's great to have it here. Uh, it's great to have you all talking about this issue. You know, there's two that two areas that we really haven't talked to, about today that have overregulation, and that's recreation and hospitality. So you get into that other areas. Uh, you know, the Department of Health and 
lots of other departments that have a lot of regulations that, that affect businesses in Wyoming. Uh, you know, there's, there's several things that, that I've, I've thought about, about regulations. Uh, Mr. Hamilton uh, mentioned the game and fish a minute ago. And, and for a long, long time, business people in, in Wyoming are doers and not just studiers. Well, there was a uh, impact on sage grouse. So there was a, uh, a person that wanted to do sage grouse, raise sage grouse. The legislature approved that, but when it came to the regulations uh, that they wrote, that the department wrote about that, it was very burdensome. Just about couldn't do it. And now we see we have more core area. The time is now to, to have that work. And they proved they can raise them. Now they got to put them out. And there's a lot of regulation there that, that could be streamlined. Uh, we've got several areas. Go ahead. So I'll just kind of uh, go through some of the, the thoughts and ideas I had on some of our, our topics. Uh, one thing, when I think about regulation, I think the one reason, and many people have said it today, the one reason that we're capable in Wyoming of uh, find a, a resolution to regulation is that we used to work together. We used to find ways that our departments and those teams and our and the private sector could find a resolution. And I will tell you today, um, I, I was actually at a national meeting where DOTs were talking about, you know, we used to do partner, partnering with DOTs and that kind of went to the wayside. But with the turnover in our departments, we don't have the history anymore. We don't have those people existing that understand why why we have regulations or why it didn't work in the past. And I think what we're coming up to today is an us versus them, right? We're, we're the bad people. For some reason, business is a dirty word. To, to, be, a, to be a private owner and make money is, is a bad thing. And so, um, and I'll tell you, I, I, had, I was lucky enough to work two years uh, in the public sector. And that was the biggest problem for me is being faced with, I wasn't challenged to actually work with people. The answer was no, right? I, I wasn't capable and that's not my background. I, I work in construction. I am a problem solver. I'm a communicator. I'm a collaborator. I want, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I want to have a team around me that can figure it out. And I quickly, I was only there for two years because I quickly learned that that was not an opportunity for me, right? Your, your job is to say no. Your job is to stay within these boundaries. And even if you have a good idea, don't bring it to me because it's not going anywhere. So I think our agencies need a little bit more lean way, you know? And I, I always ask my team today, um, how, how do we do better? How do we reestablish a learning environment and a teaching environment within my own team? And the answer is we ask why. We continue to ask why until we know if there is a reason for that. And we don't ask why anymore. There's no, um, the team members at the bottom at the state don't, don't have that um, authority to do so. I'll give you one example. I, uh, the Workforce Service Department is wonderful. You guys supply them with great grants. One of those is the internship grant. Um, I know a lot of people are utilizing it. Uh, although <laughs> it took, I, I'll tell you, 98% of businesses in Wyoming are small businesses. So they do not have attorneys on staff. They do not have HR departments on staff. They do not have engineers on staff. I'm lucky enough that I do have an HR professional on staff. And it took her over 20 hours to complete the entire process for an intern application, to turn in all the paperwork for one intern, and to get, to get it approved. And that was for $12,000. And it, although it's a great program, I'm telling you the small, the small businesses don't have that person. The person, the HR person is the person who started the company, who's doing the payroll, who's doing the hiring and firing, who's also trying to manage the team. So, um, and we, <laughs> the, the application is a lot, and we've been trying to talk to them about that. I will tell you, there are pieces in that application that I took out and use in my company today. 
But there's one piece in that application that I questioned. And I said, there were three questions at the very end for this intern. Did you learn how to communicate on a, cell, on a phone call? Did you learn how to answer a phone? Did you learn uh, Excel and Word document skills? And can you please explain those? And my, my response back was, that's pretty limiting. Are we thinking that only the only intern that exists in the world is someone that works behind a desk? Because in my world, they're mechanics, they're laborers, they're concrete finishers, right? So I can't, they're going to tell you no to every single one of those questions. And they have no aspiration whatsoever to ever answer a phone or ever work Excel, right? And the answer back was, and I said, I can give you, we can answer other questions. You know, let me give you some other areas that they could answer that and, and actually show you that they, they accomplished something in their internship. And they said, no, those are the questions at stake. Please answer them. So we said no. And of course, they were wrong and we had to go back. So I just think we have to start partnering again. We have to start learning from each other. It can't be a no. Um, and and the, the, that comes from the top, right? If the leadership's not willing to allow that to happen, then it's not going to happen below. I'll give one other example I have of regulation that I think is great, but has also become detrimental to small business. Um, I am a contractor. I am a local contractor. And uh, we love local contractors and subcontractors working in the state. But a few years ago, we kind of adjusted the way that we do that, and we bid a job, and we had you have to prove that everyone's in state, and but one of our local subs didn't know that he had to have a certificate, and he has been here for 40 years, and so when it came down to it, I lost the bid because my one subcontractor, local person, had no idea because he doesn't have the resources to be able to figure out what new policy came out from a state law change. And so that was heartbreaking for us because our team lost it. It luckily did go to someone else within the state, but um, it, it's just something that too many of our local businesses don't have the teams to go through new regulations and new policies and honestly don't have the staff to come up here and tell you how hard it is for them to do business in Wyoming. And I'll leave you with this last one, which is hard for me to even talk about. And Cindy brought it up, and I thought, oh my gosh. The last time I brought this up, I had a pencil thrown at me, Cindy. So thank you very much. But <laughs> um, is local control. Um, there is a balance to it. And I think nobody likes to, to say that you know the state should have a little bit more control. But when it comes, I'll, again, one example. When it comes to permitting in Cheyenne, it's a nightmare and you do have to have an engineer to be able to permit a commercial job and you do I, I heard today that it takes seven days i mean for a commercial job it could take months for a permit to be released um and we just uh, applied for a, a permit in another county that took less than two hours because they don't care right they don't have any regulations and i don't think that either one is wrong but there's got to be an in-between because to to not care and just take my money is also kind of concerning right and and so the the what i've heard from i i know a couple of contractors in wheatland that would love to work in cheyenne but here's the problem the regulations we have locally scare them they're used to pulling a permit in two hours just to put the money down and to come up here that they're very afraid and so again I, the larger companies do everything we can to help them, but ultimately that, that shouldn't be my job to help educate consistently and give them the power to come here. So with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Rob to see if well, he has for another else. couple of ideas, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, you know, it, sh it shouldn't be an us versus them mentality. Uh, in my former life as a county commissioner, uh, we had a we had a group come to the county and what they wanted to privatize some housing and and so they came in and presented to the commission and before that meeting i had all of the the department heads lined up in the back and uh so after they were done i looked back at the back and i said well guys let's figure out how to help these people Let's figure out how to how to help them find a way to make this work. Mr. Chairman, I actually had one of them say, what do you mean? 
that just the culture is not there to go to yes. And, and yeah, you need to work within the system, but help those people because those people are the government. They're the, they're the reason you're there. And, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty tough. I was always, after we had lots of department heads go through planning and zoning in the building department, you get a punch list. And, and when they first come in, you tell them everything they need to have. And, and so they know right off the bat, you know, I need eight things, whatever it is. And when they get those eight things, then they're done. <laughs> and uh, I think it's lacking in a lot of areas today. Uh, they don't have that punch list. And, it, and it's such a rigmarole that, yeah, they don't want to come to a bigger county. They don't want to get out of their normal uh, business operation. Uh, so it, it's tough. We heard this morning that the, the business council actually has a person, and, and boy, I didn't know that, that might help with guidance uh, or grievances. Uh, and so how do we publicize that? How do we make that available to the rest of the state? Uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, rules and regulations that are very tough for people to follow, and it's tough for our businesses to get a handle on. Uh, and we've got that paper uh, beforehand the, in Utah, the Office of Regulatory Reform. I mean, that's publicized and that's where you go. So if we've got one in Wyoming, let's publicize it and let's make sure that's where they go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I think the Beef Business Alliance uh, uh, stands ready to help negotiate through the process if we can do anything else. Uh, Lauren, did you have anything else? We appreciate being in part of this, and, and uh, Cindy is on the panel, and, and uh, you'll hear, I think, lots from the business community in general. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions? Here you ever guess. <laughs> Senator Reich. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. Mr. Hendry, we go back a ways in Trona County, and thank you. I think we sat lunch today together. I liked what I heard today from you folks. It sounds like um, a laissez-faire economy where let the free market work its magic. Um, you know, I guess my question, main, my first question, I have two questions. The first one is, I'm not sure if I fully know the mission of the Wyoming Business Alliance. And, um, you know, number two is the comments you made about just the, you know, just the, I don't know what the right word for it is. I don't want to use too strong a word, but I, I've, been, I've pulled a lot of building permits in my career and mainly redevelopment, um, old commercial office buildings. And I used to brag all the time about how, how un, uh, you know, restricted it was in Natrona County. I could go make an application in the morning and by the afternoon I had a sign permit. I was ready to go. And I mean, business just works so much better when you're not hobbled wondering, you know, how long it's going to take to get a building permit and you're, weather and contractors that are lined up um i you know it's frustrating and it, and it goes back to a lot of the culture that we the comments we heard today about the culture it's changed now in natrona county and it's just more onerous every year to proceed ahead and and get things done when you're ready to do them i mean you get a, you know a new lease signed and they have a deadline and they need to be moved in by a certain date and you're waiting and waiting for the building department to sign off on that. And pretty soon, you know, they, you wonder whether they're going to stick around or not. So uh, thanks for your good comments today. Good to see you guys here today. Explain to me the mission of, of the Wyoming Business Alliance. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'm happy to answer that question on behalf of the witnesses. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lance, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Senator Ide, um, all of our information about our organization is on our website, 
uh, www.wyomingbusinessalliance.com, but just briefly, our mission is Wyoming Business Alliance. Mission is to promote and advocate for a growing economy by connecting business leaders from across Wyoming, representing business interests and issues and partnering with key business organizations and trade associations. And then we have several strategic objectives and guiding principles. So be happy to visit with you offline if you'd like to learn more about our organization. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you both very much. Thank you. Let's see here. Ah, the Association of General Contractors. Always a pleasure. Welcome. I did this in Douglas and it worked perfect, but every time I'm here, I can't get it on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the task force, Stan Benford, executive director of AGC of Wyoming. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to be the last person to speak on the agenda. I stand between you and going home today. So uh, you asked about regulatory reform. I have about six pages worth that I'd like to start just bullet point. Just kidding. I did pull our membership. Um, I didn't really receive a ton of feedback on this. There was grumbling at the federal level. I explained to them this isn't really what this task force was designed to do. I've been listening. And if you would like me to get a little more information on some of that federal grumbling, I'm, I'm happy to do that for further down the road. Um, but I kind of pushed back on that and said anything state regulatory we could get after for you. I really didn't get a little a lot. Um, at the risk of being questioned by Mr. Parfit, what we did get came from Department of <laughs> Environmental Quality. Um, we have some just little, we'd like to look at air quality permitting. I, ha I had a contractor call me about his asphalt um, plants and concrete, the crushers, the portable crushers they have. They have to permit those for every single job they do um, in each permitting process. So this uh, contractor was about 30 days to turn it in. 60 days to hear back. So we're looking at four months on that process. Uh, he was a part of a reform in Montana that went to a permitting by rules situation where we, the EQ there and a team of contractors met and agreed upon a set standard of rules so that the permitting process went faster. That's the extent of my knowledge on that one. I can get him back on the phone if we want to look at that. Um, we also talked about drilling the drilling notices uh, he talked about having to drill four holes, nowhere near an aquifer, um, four inch wide, and had to bond for $8,000. Um, and then it takes two to three months for that notice to go through its process. So those are the two comments I got specifically on anything. Um, the rest of it, I would say, I don't think that we're getting the responses for let's say why not or our state construction but we have committees set up where we're partnering with them um for example why dot was willing to look at a, an issue we're having on bridge deck demolition they require a 15 pound jackhammer and i before i took over agc i did workforce development and if you want to find a quicker way to get someone out of the construction industry it's to ask them to demo a bridge deck with that jackhammer um <laughs> They've been open to listening to us. We, we've done a few demonstrations of how we can do it with different equipment now, um, heavier machines. And, and so I just think that the partnering that we've done, the cooperating that we have been able to do, I sit in an advisory role on state construction board. Um, we have an open line of communication with them. I will say DEQ and I have an open line of communication. We, we talk uh, non-coal blasting regulations, which might surprise you don't really exist. Um, and so we, we do want to meet to actually bring some regulations in. The, the term cowboy blasting was described to me numerous times, and I think that's not something our state necessarily wants to be proud of. Um, so we're working with them. So it's not that we don't have an open line of communication. It's just on a couple of things we haven't gotten there yet. So I, I don't know that my, the, my member silence on this was because they don't they didn't think anything would change. I think they feel like when we do have issues, the, the state agencies that govern us, we've been pretty successful in working those out with those agencies. And with that, I will stand for questions.
questions? Eric Barkley. Uh -huh. Uh, so, Mr. Benford, thank you for the comments. Uh, I do appreciate those. And uh, would you be willing to uh, um, have a conversation afterwards uh, yes. so I can get some more details on that and track some things down uh, related to those concerns that you've heard? Mr. Chairman, yes, of course. Yeah, I don't think it's ever just to mention, I don't think it's ever too bad to say that you feel like you are being heard when you have questions and you're working well with the agencies. It's right. refreshing. And, and hopefully at the work of this committee, we'll make it far more the norm than than usual. So we appreciate it. Further questions? Always appreciate the thoughts of the AGC. Five o'clock on the dot. Um, as our co-chair said, we discussed about <clears throat> kind of three different areas, agriculture, energy, housing. I was asked from one of my Senate brethren about the sandbox idea. The sandbox idea kind of goes through all three. You could have three different regulatory sandboxes. You could have one and three different parts. It doesn't really matter, but it overarches amongst all three. So I don't think it, you know, say if you're in agriculture, you're going to talk about a sandbox. You can't talk about it if you're in one of the others. But what I'd like to do right now to start is the first question is, based on what you've heard today, is there something that you've been left wanting to hear? Something that we can, the staff level, that we can work to provide you as we get ready to staff these committees and to move forward? People you want to hear from, information you want. Example, a lot of talk about housing today, a lot of talk about the shortage of housing, about it. Well, if, one of the things that the co-chair and I discussed as we were looking online, half the counties in this in the state have lost population in the past in the past few years. Sometimes the data that you see in one area kind of belies what you're hearing in another. So maybe we need to take a look at that before as as we delve into some of these housing issues. Um, you know, very interesting talk today we heard from the folks at Harvard about, you know, things that they look at. You know, I'm, some people might have some different ideas on that, want to hear some more. Where did their data come from? Um, you know, talked about a place in Australia. Maybe, you know, maybe there was some more data that we could be found that maybe someone would like to have. Um, things along those lines, like I say, just a couple of examples. So with that, any information, and I know the staff is ready and pin in hand, but we'll ask Hank first, he has a comment. Well, Mr. Chairman, the only thing that I was gonna mention is that there's public comment on the agenda. Oh, I God, wasn't sure if there was anyone in the oh, that audience that, was willing, sorry, or that wanted to testify. I forgot there might be some. <laughs> well, while you're thinking about that, while you're thinking about that, Mr. Michael, I would like to speak to us. And we are excited to hear from him. Here he is. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and, and I know it's late and I know we're tired and I'm tired. It's been we've been here a long time. I'm raring to go. Um, I do want to just sit, make a couple points and I think um, I'll, I'll try to avoid things that have been said already. But I do believe that this task force has the opportunity to be one of the more meaningful um, endeavors that the state has done in a long, long time. Um, some of the things I've heard today, we, we hear a lot in the state. We, we love to bash on the federal government, and I do as much as anybody. I love to bash on the federal government and pat ourselves on the back. But I'm here to tell you that we can do better at the state level. There are things that we can do and we need to do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a partner at the law firm of Pollen and Hart. I've spent the last 20 years uh, representing mostly mineral industry, oil and gas companies, coal companies, uh, energy companies in the regulatory process. We appreciate our relationships that we have, our state agencies on the whole, everything you've, you've heard is, is right. I think that they really try hard, they really do a good job, but there are things that we can do better. Um, I'm gonna address this, I might be the only one today that has kind of some specific recommendations. Uh, the first one is we talked about housing. I just wanna be clear, this is a regulatory reduction task force. The way to get to more affordable housing, I think the testimony showed is reducing regulations, right? We're not talking about government subsidies. We're not talking about government programs. What can we do to re reduce regulations uh, to make housing more affordable? And we can, and we know that, and we were excited to share a whole bunch of information on that. Number two, as we talked this morning about, about primacy, um, we love 
when the state has primacy, that is absolutely important. But um, the primacy plus piece and what we would like to see happen is a, is a change to the statutes that says that when the state, when a state agency is, has primacy and they're in, implementing a federal program, that the state agency cannot be more stringent than the federal program they're implementing. Um, unless the policymakers, the legislators have said in statute those areas where they can be. Um, we heard uh, Chief Perkins this morning talk about there are times maybe we want to do that, but let's do that at the, at the policy decision maker, the legislature, and, and be thoughtful. Um, we've seen where kind of that regulatory creep comes and our agencies are in fact in, enforcing those more strict than, than the federal requirements. Um, so I'd like to see a statute. I think it'd be beneficial to have a statute that, that sets that um, parameter. Number two is a statute of limitations and enforcement actions. Most of the other states around have a statute of limitations. We don't. I think that's something to think about um, and something to look at. Um, on, the, on the primacy, back to that, several other states, South Dakota is the best example. They have a really good law that, that does what I talked about on primacy. Um, Arizona and North Dakota have similar laws. Um, Wyoming even has that in some areas, but not in all. So I think there's lots of information we can share on that. The statute of limitations, I think, is helpful. Um, a lot of these companies you work with, you're getting enforcement actions for things that happened way in the past. You don't have that information. You're asked to defend against that. We have statute of limitations and tax statutes in other places. Uh, it's a way to be business friendly. And the final one, and, and this is, we've, we've talked this, I talked about this a lot, but it is um, the idea of this culture. It is the idea of retaining people. Um, I could give you lots and lots and lots of examples. When you have, these are really, really complicated issues, right? These are hard things that we're asking these state employees to deal with and they're brand new, you know, I'm getting older, but they're just kids out of school and, and it's really hard. And it's, it's a difficult thing. I, I can tell you one really complicated uh, consent decree that we worked on. We had four different lawyers from the AG's office throughout the, the start to finish of that. So every time you have to go in and, and retrain them and talk to them and get them up to speed, that costs Wyoming business owners a lot of money. And so as legislators, as, as policymakers, as, as we're trying to save money, as we're trying to trim the state budget, which I, again, support and agree with, we need to be careful of you know, are we, are we uh, stepping over dimes to save pennies, right? That we need to make sure we're paying, as a lawyer, I, 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 you know, you heard, uh, again, Chief Perkins say, we need, we need good lawyers, we need good lawyers, we need to keep our good, because that's the other part, is the really talented um, state employees, the ones that are, understand it and get into a good job are the ones that usually leave. And that's, that's a hard place to be as a, somebody trying to, to permit something when, person you've been working with, the person who really understands your business, who's really doing a good job, leaves and goes out into the private sector. Um, so those are the, the three main things I'd like to see. Look at primacy, look at a, a ceiling that says when we're implementing primacy, um, we don't go more stringent. Two, let's look at what other states are doing with statute of limitations. That's a, a very important piece. And then let's see what we can do to retain. Um, because I think that that culture that we keep talking about comes from keeping people there that are good at their jobs. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Questions for Mr. Mike White. Questions? Oh, Mr. Ott, or Senator Ott. Would you just, uh, the, the first two were, uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, by the way, Mr. Michael I, thanks for being here. The, um, uh, the second one you gave on, on statute of limitations, could you just comment a little deeper on that? Thank you. Sure. So what happens when there's a, a notice of violation or when something happens and, and somebody, you know, it happens, right? <laughs> Some, somebody's out of compliance, um, that it would set that it only goes, and I think some states are seven years, some states are five years, I think, and I don't want to say anything wrong. I think Colorado is actually two years on some of their things. Um, and we can look, I'm not here to advocate for a specific um, timeline, but say, look, any violation that happened more than seven years ago, you're not responsible for. I think there's a responsibility on the enforcement agency to go in and find those things. But also, these, these people have turnover inside their own companies. And to try to disprove something, say, seven years ago, is, it puts them in a really tough situation. Thank you. Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Well, Mr. Michael, that brings up another question. Uh, so if you were knowingly hiding a fact of, uh, of a, a crime, we'll call it a crime, I don't know if it's criminal or not, but say an offense, uh, it, would you be in favor of exempting that situation from, uh, say, a statute of limitations? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Cole, and those are certainly discussions, right, that you can have, and, and most crimes have statute limitations. Um, these usually aren't, but we can, you can design it however you want. And if it's something knowingly, yes, I think it should be a different standard. Um, but those are discussions I think that this task force should take into account and, and consider. Other questions? I want to go there. I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Michael, thank you very much. Further public comment. Further public comment. Sure. Further public comment. You may? Scared them all off, huh? Okay. Okay. Back to our question. Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just there was a question or a statement made by the agencies that uh, it sounded to me the way it was presented that uh, they felt that, you know, there were shalls in statute, they shall do a certain thing. And they made mention that possibly changing a shall to a may under some circumstances to give them latitude. So I think there's anything I'd like to know more is just uh, the agencies elaborating on that, on that statement that they'd like to get more latitude and uh, they can't with the current way statutes are written. And maybe to uh, give some examples uh, that maybe they think are uh, getting in the way of them being more flexible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Mr. Lancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the, to, in response to your questions about, you know, maybe even preparation for our next meeting about additional uh, testimony or discussion points, we have an exceptional director over at a &I, and I, We've heard all day long this theme of culture. Maybe we could have someone from the HR at the state to talk about how state employees are onboarded and you know, if there's some gaps or some needs there as far as trying to foster that, that ability and spirit to work together. Because really in Wyoming, that's how we do our best work. We work together. We're used to working with each other. You know, Mr. Michael, I bringing up four different lawyers on a project, like nobody wins by having this constant, you know, lack of, of disconnect from each other as neighbors, as business colleagues, as friends, as, you know, everyone knows their place in the, you know, their role in the regulatory process, but that doesn't mean the process has to be adversarial. You know, people bring different talents and experience. When you listen to someone like Mr. McGagna that brings decades of experience to how to approach a problem that maybe, you know, that could come up with a solution, by us not really leveraging that ability of talent, I think we're missing an opportunity that we could maybe be doing a little better that probably wouldn't cost a dime, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more, as a matter of fact, and I said that right off the top about, you know, there's, you know, there are a lot of organizations in state government that I think that we do, that do, you know, employees across the enterprise, local government, state government, at all levels, that are really doing it right. And there are some best practices, I, I too, and I, I hasten just to call out any in specific, because I make it feel like, well, maybe others aren't as much, but I know I do a lot of work with the Department of Workforce Services. And whenever I talk to them at Workforce Services, and usually it's a problem with the constituent that they're having with UI or, or uh, workers' comp or something like that. But whenever I talk to them, they always talk about the client, their client, what their clients need. Oh, or, oh you're calling about one of our clients. Which we have, Can you tell me more about their problem? It's more about the way they're asking and framing the question. It reminds me of, of when I call a customer service organization in the private sector. It's the attitude, it's the, it's the culture. And I think that culture comes from the top. And I think that uh, they, like say, are they perfect? No, usually I'm calling with a problem someone's having. But they seem to try to want to solve the problem. They do want to seem to try to get the information to solve it. There are many of those across the enterprises, more often than not. And I know we, you know, today we've heard a lot of, you know, sometimes more of the negative side of things, but we also know there are a lot of positives there. Inside our own organization, I know 
you know, I'm constantly in awe of our legislative service office and the work they do for us, whether it's during the session or during the interim. They travel, they take care of their here long hours to do that work. You don't see that every day. And it's something that we kind of almost take for granted. And it's something that we need to keep that in mind. So yes, I think maybe if we ask, you know, maybe ask the departments, you know, what, what, what do you feel best about about your department? And say, maybe, you know, as we get and gather that information, and maybe even just by other departments to look in and say, hey, boy, there's a good idea. And we might find that we might have, you know, I think everyone wants to try to be better and wants to try to solve it. So maybe we can help ourselves and, and maybe save ourselves a little work because uh, folks will pick up on that. And, and if that's what we want to do and that's where we want to be. And that's another one of the big things I want to tell everybody. I think I've heard that loud and clear from this group today. And I know that's where you all want to be. We may disagree on some of the ways to get there. And uh, you know what the role of government is or isn't, um, but uh, that is seems to be an overarching theme. So we'll work on that. Other questions, other information people want to get. So Cole. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say something. I, I think the only way that this we're going to be successful is to incorporate uh, all the departments and have them have a conversation, a real conversation about issues they're facing and come up with real solutions. This, this situation I think we're into today took decades to get here, decades. And it's gonna take years to kind of unwind, but we're not gonna be able to be very good unwinders of this problem unless we have cooperation with the directors at a, at a very granular level about just what can be done and why do we need to do it? and How can that make things better? And I look forward to that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kolb. Any other information? Oh, no. yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, listening to the conversation we've had and thinking back about those agricultural issues, Mr. McGagna brought up several of them. Uh, there's a couple of things out there that we don't have much uh, influence on that really affects agriculture. One of them is labor. We just can't find it, just like everybody else. Uh, when it comes to the Department of Environmental Quality, for agriculture, that really falls into the non-point source pollution area. And there's an increased emphasis on a national level on those things. I think it would be helpful to have someone, if we're going to be in a subcommittee anyway, to have some discussion from DEQ as it relates to non-point source pollution. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has primacy over pesticide registration in the state. And we've wrestled with this on and off for a long time. And I think that having some discussion about that process, what's needed there, what sort of things are we not doing, what sort of things are we doing, uh, is very helpful. Uh, I know we had the, the uh, wool growers on there, and, and Jim, you've, you've worked on this. Predator control is a big issue for some of our agricultural producers, particularly in the sheep industry. And again, that's a, pro, that's a program within the Department of Agriculture and also working in conjunction in some instances with the Wyoming Game and Fish. So if we're going to be talking about some of that, that would be helpful as a subcommittee. Not everybody needs to hear about our problems. Right? Uh, but it may be helpful if we do go to a subcommittee type of a function to, to, to have those discussions. Uh, and another one, I guess, of course, would be in the Department of Agriculture, their, their Natural Resources Division, because they have a, a lot of folks bird dogging those things that affect us on federal issues. How can we perhaps weigh in better? So thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Senator Bebout, you had a quite, you added some information you wanted or a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just just several things and, and uh I really enjoyed listening today and to everybody, their input and a lot of knowledge in this room, plus the, the good citizen that testified. Uh a couple of things. Uh one of the things that I think was missing today might have been game and fish. And and I look at the oil and gas industry and, and I look at uh you know, like the different industries in our state, and there's 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 issues there that game and fish we can work together on, and there's issues there where we I guess we're adversarial, but I think we need to be in the same room. So I don't know if you've talked to the GOAT chairman about game and fish 
just a thought, maybe you run it by the governor's office just to think about that, maybe being involved in some of this discussion. Uh, the other thing is one of the real opportunity in Wyoming is tertiary recovery with the utilization of CO2. And it's been proven in the past on fields that it's huge return for the state of Wyoming. And, but there's, there's some impediments there under CCUS to be able to, to get it and do it and utilize it. And part of it deals with the PSC and maybe we could think about that because these fields are there, they're legacy fields. The infrastructure is there. All we got to do is get the CO2 there, find the CO2, get it there, and we reap the benefits of the increased production and the royalties and the income and the severance tax. That's an area I think we ought to look at. One of the things, too, Mr. Mr. Chairman, maybe some people can remember, but I, I believe it was our good friend Senator Enzi way back when had a bill. I might have even been involved with him on it about a voluntary audit. And I can't remember the specifics of the bill, but we might want to have Alice go get, dust that off and look at it because the way I remember it is you were able to work within the DEQ and voluntary audits on coal where you, you stepped up, did it, and then there were some benefits to doing it. And of course, if you found something, you reported it. And maybe there's something out there we could utilize or fine tune to, to work a little bit better with. The last thing, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned workforce services. You know, we want to have people know that Wyoming is open for business, but there's a lot of pluses that maybe people don't realize. And I work in a lot of states, and one of the big ones is our workers' comp system. Other states have private insurance. Uh, the way they treat you when you come into the state is almost it's almost criminal. Uh, we really have a great system here for that. And so there's a lot of pluses that we should be spelling out about our state, you know, in terms of how we promote our state the blue sky and all the wonderful things we have, but right inside the way we do like workers' comp is one of them. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you. Just some thoughts I had that right off the top of my head. Thank you, Senator. And just looking over at staff, do we have that for me? Okay. Representative Davis. One thing, uh, I, Mr. Chairman, one thing I... I heard loud and clear was that 98% uh, or a large majority of us are small businessmen. So these regulations, we need to keep them simple yet informative so that we as the small business agencies can follow them and stay in compliance. So I think we need to figure out how to bring all this stuff down, keep it simple, yet informative. Director Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, I've been thinking about A and I, uh, the Office of A and I, uh, and they're the ones that really establish the the position uh, qualifications and what our options are in terms of salary adjustments and getting people in the right uh, job classification. So I don't know if it would be of any value to have somebody to kind of speak to that so that we would all have an understanding of what what can and can't be done within the existing structure. Um, and, and just one other thing, Mr. Chairman, um, and I'm glad uh, 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 Mr. Bebout had brought this up, and this is on the point of environmental audits. Um, and I just wanted to, to remind uh, Mr. Bebout in his time, uh, we did uh, pursue uh, and actually have a very active environmental audit program based on that law that was passed. Uh, and in fact, we actually went out and got an, a memorandum of understanding with EPA so that they wouldn't come in and overfile on our audits. So uh, I think that's a good thing to, to keep in front of us. All right. Further. Ah. I would add a question as well, I guess. Um, we heard testimony from several other, uh, you know, I guess entities out there in the state that also require bonding. It's something that the mineral committee and the mineral industry is very familiar with, but I think I would like a better understanding of what that entails in the other industry sectors, aside from mining, if that's possible. Thank you. Just have to see if we can just get up a whole one pager on that. Thank you. Also two, um, one thing I wanted to make sure it said uh, Representative Knapp and Representative Ottman were here before, and I did not introduce them, and I apologize for that. They um, were here today just to listen, and actually, uh, Representative Ottman was asking me about illegal dumping. 
and that, that's a big problem up in up in her neck of the woods and i don't know where that falls into what we've been talking about today but as far as regulatory i don't know but it seems that the way it was described to me was that you know due to permitting problems uh, that, that are occurring at the, at the at the local level that that is actually being a problem maybe other counties are having problems with that forcing rates to go up which are forcing people to go out and illegally dump. and so that's something that maybe you just want to maybe you know just take a look at and uh, see if we can just get some information on it because she did ask and so i wanted to make sure we did that further questions mr chairman thank you um i I'm not sure if this maybe is a more appropriate discussion for the subcommittee on housing, but I, I think that we were very ambitious this morning with our agenda, and I'm not sure we really got to hear from the state fire marshal, but we currently have six codes in enforcement. We have the International Fire Code, the International Building Code, the International Fuel and Gas Code, the International Mechanical Code, the International Building Code, the Northern or national electrical code. And as of July 1st, 2023, we will now also have the national electric code will be in effect. So all of those subgroups that you identified, I think these codes touch all of them. And so maybe a revisit back from the state fire marshal to help us understand, you know, to Representative Davis's point on how these codes interface with small business. And, and I think the testimony is clear from the business community that we wanna be good good you know corporate citizens follow the rules we just sometimes there's just some complexity in figuring out what it is and we're happy to do them when we know but identifying like how all this kind of interfaces together as we build houses as we operate our agricultural operations as we're in the minerals industry might be worth a revisit or a larger discussion and I see a hand raised there, right there, right, right where the uh, fire marshal is. So, and you don't have to explain all that right now. Maybe even a written report would be helpful because I too, just to build on that before you answer, um, you know, I saw that as well. And I, I was as because I kind of hear it a little differently out there in the hinterlands about, you know, that there might be some, that, that maybe is not. <laughs> The, the norm out there in from county to county or city to city on how they're doing it. With that, Mr. Very Farmer. quickly, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, to Mrs. Delancey and, and to the point of, of everyone on the task force, one of the opportunities that we have is, is to talk about that, that available and what becomes affordable housing. And approximately a week ago, I had an opportunity to meet with our federal friends on other programs that we can borrow and or recreate to our Wyoming standards. And I think there's a good opportunity there and I really welcome that conversation. Very good. Representative Conrad, any comments, questions for you? I haven't heard from you much today. Just wanted to make sure you were <laughs> right there. Just tick there. Uh, no, thank you, uh, Chairman Drew. No, just uh, reinforces as uh, to reiterate what uh, former Senator Bebout said. I mean, this. This whole discussion was unbelievably and most importantly invaluable. I just it goes back to my overall comment that was we gain, that I began with. You know, as as we review these regulatory reductions, I mean, it's going to allow us to become more efficient in these requirements. But also, I think uh, there's an optics here as well that as we reduce these burdens, uh, we be, improve costs, we improve benefits, but also we improve our transparency. That as uh, someone who's in the state, whether function or faction or business or entity that is, we have the opportunity to really welcome them in without having them worry about the bureaucratic processes that are convoluted, strange, and different. So I, it's a, a great meeting, and I appreciate your leadership in this, and I look forward to being a part of the process and the solutions moving forward. Thank you, Representative. Moving further. Okay. Oh, there, Mr. Barron. Just to weigh in, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, thank you. You bet. I really want to put an exclamation point behind your comments on culture and Ms. Lancy's comments on culture and the importance of uh, instituting solutions at the town level, municipality, county level, as well as the state. Super important. And uh, the labor shortage uh, is you know, pervasive in local government as well as state government, as well as the private sector. So every tool we can do provide um, will be helpful. I also thank you for bringing up the fire codes, electrical codes, because that is uh, potent, it's just as 
uh, potential a hindrance as some of the regulations that we've come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Before I didn't want to let that slip by, uh, Director Parfit there mentioned about uh, Director Bach and A and I, and, and so maybe get you know I didn't know if you had that, but just make sure that we get a chance to touch base with her and 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 get those questions and get that answer out. Okay, where do we go from here? Um, I've got a hunch, just a sneaking hunch, that this conversation that we've had today, below these many hours, um, is going to generate as many questions out there in the public as it answers. I think that we're probably, maybe even from the contractors, maybe even hear a little bit more. Um, because, you know, we brought up a lot of subjects today, and some things have been said that have been interesting, to say the least. And so, like I say, I think it may spur some more comment. What I'd like to ask is your indulgence. Um, we'd like to hear, the co-chair and I would like to hear from you, your thoughts about where you see yourselves fitting into this and where we go forward, one. Two, any other questions that you have um, that we can get answered for you? And what we're gonna do is we've asked the staff to prepare some, to prepare some more documents. We've got some questions and some things that we've asked for from them. We need to give them some time to get it for us. So what I would say is give us, give us till the end of next week to try to flesh some of these things out. As we do, uh, we'll get through staff, we'll come back to you, and then we'll ask specific questions. Where do you want to be? Where do you see yourself fitting in? I think our next meeting will be a virtual one as we kind of set that set that up and try to do it within the next 30 days if we can. I know summer schedules are tough. They're busy. People are traveling. People are you know working and got a lot of things going on. I'd like to try to get that done because then we can we can move forward to set up then to having another live meeting. And then whether we have that meeting here or Senator B about at another location closer to you. Um, I heard you. <laughs> always hearing um, that we'll try to fit that in and see if we can see if we can get that together. I like to say, I know it's difficult for those of you who are not involved in interim committees uh, as members, but as testifiers, you know how difficult that can be. For those of us that are on them, you know, we have to make sure that we coincide, get everyone's schedule coincide um, for at least, at least on six schedules and then yours will be on that. So you're gonna to need to give us a little indulgence if you can. Is there any problems, questions with that? Senator Cole. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if I understand your structure, is, there's gonna be three groups of subcommittees, uh, ag, energy, and housing is what I had heard. But you, I mean, there's a lot of things that could fit in a lot of these different buckets. Could, could leadership please uh, maybe clarify a bit on maybe what groups you want to focus on? Because I think all three of us working on the sandbox and three committees is probably, you know, not time effective. So my question would be is maybe took some time to come up with a more clear defined buckets of, uh, of uh, focus. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I'll make sure the co-chair and I get, to, get, get the committee an answer to that one first. Kevin Grew. Yes. So just a question, or more importantly, a comment or editorial in this case. I know we've talked about a lot of issues today, a lot of opportunities. I would just remind ourselves that our goal is regulatory reduction, not regulatory creation. It's awful easy sometimes to create more regulation to improve. So I would just remind us that our goal and objective is regulatory reduction. So thank you. You mean like task forces to uh, end uh, sales tax exemptions where we always seem to add a bunch and never get rid of any? Yeah, okay. That's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Any other questions? Listen, thank you so much. I know it's been a really long day for those of you in the audience, for those of you here, the staff, thank you very much for all your help. I know we all appreciate it very much, the co-chair and I want you to know that. The committee, thank you. Thank you for the lunch. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. And we hope you feel it's productive. And then whenever, and seriously, we want to, we want to know, Co-Chair and I talked about this, we, you know, 
anytime we feel like if you feel like your time is being wasted let us know because that is exactly what we don't want to do we appreciate you very much with that we're adjourned mr chairman we won't know if it's a waste of time until the end oh well there you go <laughs> i forgot about that